Good morning, everyone. Thursday, June 23, another day in paradise. Never a dull moment. Got a great room today. Big, good, very dear friend. I'm a longtime subscriber and a good friend of this room, Michael Belkin. Um, you know, there's so much said on FinTwit and so many words spilled in the social media and everyone's got an opinion. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of information. But what about the signal? What about the knowledge? And we take information, we synthesize it, we, we maybe create knowledge. And like most of you, I read so much stuff, it just goes in one ear and out the other. But there are a handful of people who I read and I savor and I read again. I read it once, not twice, three times, four times, and I go back to. And I'm not going to embarrass them, but the speaker today is that guy, Michael Belkin. Uh, for those of you that have not known him as long as I have, um, he is the real deal. You've heard him a lot in this room, but that's only in the last few months. I've known Michael going back over 30 some odd years, and what he says may not be normal for most people, but this is normal for Michael. He um, has had more than his fair share of outsized uh, variant perceptions and calls, and I just love that uh, he's willing to come in this room and share his insights with us. Um, you know, it's interesting as I reflect on how this room has progressed over the last few months. This all started out by accident. I only discovered Twitter Spaces last fall. I did my first room in December because I didn't like the way the rooms were being run. And I think we all appreciate that strong moderation is necessary. Otherwise, conversations go off the rails and we go down rabbit holes. So... I apologize to anyone who feels they've been slighted by my uh, style of moderation, but it's for the public good. And 99% of you, when you DM me, you tell me you appreciate it. This is all about just trying to help people. And I'm not trying to sell anybody anything and just say what we believe to be the truth. I make a lot of mistakes. Michael makes a lot of mistakes. But he's the first one to admit it, as am I. We're just trying to do our best and share from our experiences and perhaps you can learn from our mistakes our mistakes so we've seen the movie before so for instance one of the topics we're going to get to in this room excuse me if there's a noise occurring the grass outside one of the topics we're going to get to this in this room is i wanted to ask michael about jgbs and the yen because as we all know shorting the japanese bond market has been the widow maker over decades and i want to talk about whether or not it'll be different this time but it's the muscle memory, it's the learned experience, which is invaluable. You know, there's two ways you can learn. You can learn either by precept or by experience. You're going to get an education one way or another. It's just a question of whether you're going to hear about it from Michael or it's going to be a more expensive type of education from Mr. Market. Many things to talk about, Michael. Uh, just to put the cat amongst the pigeons, um, top of mind, your energy call, very differentiated call. Look, who knows what's going to happen? Uh, it resonated with me. When I first saw it, I was like, uh -uh, I'm not so sure about that. But a lot of people put the question to me in the last couple of days, what do you think? And, you know, even if we don't get a recession, even if we don't get an economic recession, which I think we will, even if we just get a slowdown, I think the perception or the narrative that's going to go with that is enough to make oil sell off. When you have the paper market for energy, for oil being 40 or 50 times the size of the physical market, it doesn't really matter. You know, I tweeted out this morning that was, someone was really all bent out of shape about, um, about uh, uh, the energy call. I think I tweeted something out about energy selling off. The three aces, I mean, the number of brick brats you got thrown at you going back a few weeks ago about energy topping. Excuse me, I closed the window there. About energy topping. Very, very, there's a tell in that. And, and again, with all humility, nobody knows what's going to happen. But I always find it interesting to see the reaction, the sentiment when a call is made. Because that, that, that'll tell you a lot. And it's told me a lot. And so, you know, maybe, the, maybe we got a big recession. Maybe we don't. I think we do get a recession, whether it's a deep one or not. I don't know. But I think the perception of that, and given how, how large the uh, physical paper market is for oil compared to the physical market, 
Oh, yes. And what I started to talk about earlier, I lost my train of thought. The Keynesian Beauty Contest. The Keynesian Beauty Contest, it's not who is the most beautiful girl. You need to try to figure out who are the who do you think the judges will be to be the most beautiful girl. So everyone can sit here and say, well, you know, oil demand's not going to go down that much, and it's the supply side that counts, and blah, blah, blah. All the arguments that I was fully invested in for the last year and a half. But right here, right now, if the narrative becomes, narrative, I said, forget about reality. If the narrative becomes, we're going to have a slowdown, you know, or a recession. You know, do you want to stand around being long energy? You don't have to be short energy. I'm not arguing to be short energy. But do you really want to stay Magumbo long to disprove the theory that energy equities may just may go down if we have a global slowdown? Like, to me, that makes no sense. Now, I totally get it. If you're t- what depends on your time perspective, your time horizon. If you're like, okay, I'm in this for five years, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine. And I can cite the bullish case of energy as well as anybody. But if, on the other hand, but if you're going to do that, you don't have the right to come back 90 days from now and say, oh, you know, I lost 40% of energy stocks. I got killed. You can't have it both ways. So it's multiple time frames. And again, you know, it's a Keynesian beauty contest. It's not reality, but it's perceptions of reality. So, Michael, I want to talk about energy. I want to talk about the yen and how you have the world's second biggest bond market trading like it's, you know, Turkish lira, Argentine pesos. This is insanity. I'm reminded of Epstein's law. You know, that which can't go on won't. And I don't know where your signals are. You know, maybe the yen's going to turn. You know, what happened? You know, could the yen turn? Could JGB's turn? What would that mean for bond markets globally? Also, Europe, where the ECB stuck between a rock and a hard place. You know, they, they want to tighten. They have to tighten to, to try to curb inflation. On the other hand, that's just going to mess up spreads even more. So you can't have it both ways. Also, increasing possibility of recession. I know you're calling for a big earnings recession. I agree with that. But the, the, the numbers coming out of the housing sector are just, just absolutely disastrous. And the um, follow-on implications from that. So, lots to talk about. I've been talking enough. Michael, they came here to hear you. Well, I'm told people like to hear my rant, so I'm going to stop here. I don't know. Maybe my music's... Michael, maybe since you're... Michael, you know what? I think it might be helpful to start off. Maybe you could just tell people about your career as a musician. That'd be really interesting because maybe you could help me pick out the songs I should play. So, I don't know. Michael, how you doing? I know it's uh, 8, 8, 12 in the morning where you are at near Seattle. So, good morning, Michael. Good to see you. How are you, my friend? Good, George. How, can you hear me? How's that working? We're good. We're good. 100%. We're good. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, music. <laughs> well, I, I actually started uh, out as a professional musician in Los Angeles playing uh, uh, in recording studios, I, you know, making my living doing it, such uh, living in quotation marks. Um, I managed to pay the bills for a number of years, and uh, in the process, uh, learned uh, uh, about markets. I started, I made a little bit of money and I started playing around with the markets and um, I wanted to understand the mathematics of what made markets go up and down. That was my genesis. I uh, ended up going to the UC Berkeley Business School and studying econometrics uh, and statistics, developing my own forecasting model uh, based on time series analysis. Uh, that got me into Solomon Brothers back in 1986, started out in market analysis with Laszlo Brini, uh, ended up in proprietary trading at the end, being a quantitative, quantitative strategist. Uh, my boss was Stanley Shopcorn, there was a few other traders, um, and we we basically traded directional trading for the house account, uh, global macro. Um, then I started the Belkin Report in 1992, so I've been doing it for 30 years. So that's kind of the thumbnail sketch of where I come from. Um, in my, my, order to- my, Michael, if I just interrupt for one second, a, point, a really important point I want to make here. And in, in, in maybe I can't be as guarded as I should. You're, you're much more diplomatic than I am. But what I reflect, what I want to point out for everybody, you have a very rigorous uh, statistical method of analyzing uh, markets and trends and whatnot. And I'm partial to that only because my dad was a theoretical mathematician at Princeton. So I have a strong affinity for numbers. And when I look at 
um, much of what passes for technical analysis. And maybe it's really not fair for me to put you on the spot because I, don't, I know you don't want to speak ill of others. But when you have all these guys come out with their Fibonacci numbers and their rulers and their crayons, and, you know, they'll say stuff like if IBM's at 100, they'll say, well, you know, if it goes to 105, it opens up the door path to 110 or 115. And if it goes to 95, it opens the door path to 90 or 85. Like, like really? Like, and the problem is, and, and one, of the, one of the phrases I can't stand, you should run, not walk as fast as you can from the phrase democratization. When anyone hears democratization of finance or democratization of markets, like run. And so the problem with technical analysis is everyone has a ruler, everyone has crayons, you know, they watch Jim Cramer do it on TV. So like, you know, home gamers don't try this at home. And they're like, oh, I could do this. And so, Michael, <laughs> when you look at what passes for technical analysis on, I, I, I'll, I'll try to keep it in a positive bit. What I really value about you is there's some rigor and some discipline to what you do. Um there are a lot of smart technicians out there who are, I mean, I, I'm going to single out Dave Nikoski. I'm a huge fan of Dave's. He's in the fourth row for those who are looking at him. I urge everyone to follow Dave. He does a Vermillion report, and he's big on relative strength, and that's the altar I worship at as well. A lot of other smart technicians, Charles, that come in this room, Tom Thornton, Je, uh, Jeff Garbaz, John Rook, et cetera, et cetera. Tony Greer, I see, is next to you, another another great mind. But, Michael, what, is it, what does it mean to you when you see people at home trying to do this stuff, and they're just like – I don't know. They're just doing like simple moving averages or everyone's like, it's oversold, whatever the hell that means. So I got to buy it. I mean, Michael, you're along with everything else. You're a very decent human being. And like, when you just, when you see the stuff that goes on in the public square that passes for technical analysis, like what's your reaction to all that? <laughs> Good question. Well, I, I don't want to be too defamatory, but um, so there's one guy out there, uh, First of all, I don't do Elliott waves or draw lines on charts and say, you know, if it goes through this line, then it's going to that. That kind of that's not what I do. Other people do that, and some people are are better than others. But um, so Northman Trader, you know, Sven, um, I, I started looking at his stuff because he does levels, and I don't do levels. And I thought, well, maybe you know, Fibonacci levels or something might be interesting to look at. But I started following his stuff and. You know, we've been in a bear market. Just to give you an idea, the S&P topped first day of the year. It's down. How much is it down? <clears throat> We're down 9% in June. We're down 17% in Q2. Um, you know, we're down like 20-something percent from the peak. And NASDAQ's down 30% from the peak. And um, in, in Northman stuff, He's been buying every dip all the way down. I just don't get it. Like the primary trend, you know, who, who was that? You know, who used to say that the primary trend? It's just so critical to know what is the primary trend of the market. And um, so I see things, you know, some technical analysts, they just want to fade the trend, you know, and you can get away with that. You know, if you're a good short term trader, you can buy these little blips. But I've been on here a couple of times and people said, you know, the first time I was on, the market went up by 10 percent immediately afterwards. But here we are much lower now, you know, <clears throat> and um, the primary trend is down. And that's so what my work does is time series analysis. Um, my I, I just got back from a. Uh, a, a trip to New York City, visiting clients, saw, you know, big hedge funds, uh, all, all different kinds of fund managers. And um, my presentation was very simple. So my long-term forecast has, has turned down. The long-term model, what I do is 12-period forward forecast using monthly data and weekly data. 12-period forecast for monthly data points straight down for stock indexes, technology, um, consumer discretionary, Michael, we lost you there. Can you hear me? Yeah, Perfect. we're good. Okay, sorry about yeah. that. Yeah, uh, kind of a weak connection here. I, I live out by Puget Sound <laughs> in uh, Seattle area. Anyways, uh, S&P earnings, Q1, down 13% sequentially, $49.38. That's operating earnings according to Standard & Poor's. You know, not fact set, not imaginary earnings that other people use. Um, so... My forecast for S&P earnings points straight down. And um, what I use, the model doesn't give 
levels. It gives direction, position, intensity. It's a form of time series analysis, sort of like Fourier analysis. I, I learned the mathematics behind Fourier and Box Jenkins ARIMA models. That's autoregressive integrated moving averages. Um, and I developed my own forecasting technique, which is really black or white. It gives direction, position, and intensity. It doesn't give you a level. What I use trend analysis, and I find the 200-month average in these long-term moves it provides a pretty reliable indicator of where things could go and where they have gone in the past. So just to give you an idea, 49 bucks for uh, S&P earnings, 200-month average is 27.40, okay? And my theory of the universe here about what's happened is we had this, we had the COVID hit, the market sold off, they added nine Point five trillion dollars of stimulus, five trillion dollars of fiscal stimulus, four point five trillion dollars of Fed monetary stimulus. Now they've pulled the rug out from all that. So what that did is, it was it created a great speculative bubble. It was fun while it lasted. I was long, you know, I was enthusiastically long starting in March 2020, uh, and then the um, software started selling off in November. The Nasdaq peaked November 19th last year. So where are we now? We're eight months into a Nasdaq decline that's down about 30%. Um, so where could things go? Earnings down. So the 200-month average for quarterly S&P earnings is... Da -da 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 -da. It's around... Where are we? Bear with me one second. 27.40. 27 bucks, okay, from 49 bucks. That's down 45%. That's my forecast for S&P earnings. Annualize that, four quarters of $27 earnings, 109, 110, call it 110 bucks, ballpark. Now, on Wall Street, you know, talk to any broker, even the bearish ones, you know, Mike Wilson, Morgan Stanley, all these guys, they have 200 something earnings, you know, for S&P this year coming up, uh, looking out 12 months. Um, I, I have uh, basically half that. So earnings down, stock market down, economy down. Um, now, let me put something else in perspective. Um, you, the PMIs just came out today. U.S. manufacturing PMI 52.4 down from 57. <clears throat> you, are you still with me there? Can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. Keep going. Okay, yep. sorry. Uh, da, 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 da. Down 4.6 points today. Non-manufacturing PMI, 51.6, down from 53.4, down 2 points. European manufacturing PMI, 52, down from 54.6, minus 2.6. European non-manufacturing services PMI, 52.8, from 56.1, down 3.3. So basically, the economy, the global economy is on the verge of entering a recession according to PMIs. Um, earnings are going to decline. Earnings drive core, uh, stock prices. So that's that. That's the overall view. Um, I think um, the S&P 500 200 month average, just to put things in perspective, long-term target on this decline, 2,068 down 44%. So we're around 3,700, 36 highs, you know, 36, 3,700. The, the S&P before this major bear market that we're in uh, is over, could fall almost another 50%. NASDAQ, 200-month uh, average is 49.29. NDX, that's down 56%. So that's the overall view. So what are you going to do? Um, you're going to sit there and get eroded to death in stocks. That's not my idea of fun. So I'm telling clients, my message was sell into rallies, um, lighten up. Um, so the model forecast for sectors, the, it's really good on sector rotation. So staples, consumer staples, utilities, and healthcare have a long-term outperform signal, 12-month outperform. But I do everything relative and absolute. Relative is up for staples, utilities, healthcare, but absolute is down. That is the strongest outperform alpha signal the model has. So it's really not very encouraging. So in other words, if you expect something to go up in a bear market, you probably want to re-examine your um, assumptions. Um, now let's talk about energy. So that's what you, you know, that's my big call. So I, you're talking to somebody who was a raging energy and energy stock bull 
for 18 months. Okay, so not a broken clock. Um, when I started recommending energy stocks, uh, people wouldn't touch them with a 10-foot pole. ESG investing, blah, blah, blah. We're going solar, you know, so bad. Old energy, everything's Tesla, electricity. Da, 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 da. Okay, so I got major, major pushback, you know, 12, 18 months ago when I was saying buy energy stocks. Um, uh, that long-term signal is still up, but it's very, very late. The intermediate signal has turned down. I closed my energy stock outperform recommendation about four to six weeks ago. The intermediate term just kicked in to the downside. Um, and energy stocks are a new sell and short recommendation for me, the Belkin Report. Brand new this week. Of course, they're down. Um, I, I uh, Let me give you a little color on that. Um, the latest B of A fund manager survey found 67% of respondents believe oil will produce the best returns this year. Okay, so that consensus has gone from wouldn't touch them with a 10-foot pole, energy stocks and energy, to it's the only game in town. Everybody's loaded up on these things, even though it's, a you know, so that's what they think. That's the consensus recommendation up there. So let me put things in perspective here. Um, just to, it's not just energy. Now I was attacked last time I came on the, your, your room here, that, you know, somebody attacked me for daring to suggest that inflation was peaking and that it was time to sell and short commodities. I was viciously attacked. Uh, well, anyways, so let me just put that in perspective. What's happened? Base metals, DBB ETF, peaked March 4th. March, April, May, June. That's almost four months ago, right? It peaked at 27. Today is 21, down 23%. So base metals are basically crashing. Copper, aluminum, tin, nickel, all that stuff. Agriculture. Now, if you read, read the news, you know, it's agricultural shortages. We're all going to be, you know... Not, we're going to run out of food, Kellogg's cornflakes, the shortages, blah, blah, blah. Uh, sorry, um, grains, which were, you know, again, you're talking to somebody who was long all this stuff. Um, I covered the longs, you know, four to six weeks ago. Grains are short. They're getting killed the last few days, by the way. The DBA agricultural ETF peaked May 17th. What's that? Six weeks ago? It's down 9% as of today. USO, the... Uh, um, the uh, ETF for crude oil peaked June 8th. That's only maybe three, four weeks ago, 92. It's down 12%. XLE, energy stock ETF, peaked same day as USO, June 8th at 92. Today, it's, it's 73-something, down 20%. So the energy stocks have been getting whacked. They're quickly giving back their gains, um, their hard-won gains that were you know, over a period of 18 months. Um, and let me cut to the chase here. So what are you going to do? Be short the market. That's my recommendation to hedge funds and to long only investors, cut your exposure to the minimum. So I had, do have one very contrarian <laughs> thing, which I'll probably get attacked for. But um, actually, one of my best clients, one of my favorite clients is a big hedge fund. All they want to know from me most of the time is, what do I get the most pushback on? Because they want to fade the consensus. When the consensus is at an extreme, so they keep asking me, they always want me to alert them to when something, um, when I get major pushback, like I did last time I was on saying to short, you know, beginning to short base metals and energy and things like that. So what's, what could go up? Da -da 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 -da. Bonds, TLT. So I have TLT <clears throat> long bond as a buy. It bottomed on June 14th so far, 108.81. It's up 5%. It's up at 114, up a point or two today. Um, so there is some, uh, you know, basically what's happening is the global economy is turning south. Let me just summarize what, what I just, the PMIs collapsed today, U.S. and Europe. Bonds could rally. Ma there's a major, major short position. Everybody and his brother is short bonds because the Fed is going to raise interest rates. Well, we can talk about that in a minute about the Fed and how, you know, what they use for decision making. But um, Bitcoin, whoa, Bitcoin, you know, it's around 20,000, 20,600 at the moment. 
Two hundred month average is fifty eight seventy one five eight seven one, down seventy percent from here. Uh, you still with me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Still there? Hello. We got you. Keep on, Michael. Okay. Okay. Uh, Bitcoin is down. Uh, let's see. Bitcoin down thirty seven percent in June. Down fifty six percent in Q two, and again. Getting back to you asked about technical analysts, that guy who I mentioned, he's been buying every dip. Like I understand the attraction, you know, Bitcoin. Ah, it's there's a limited amount of production. It's digital gold, blah blah blah. I you know I get the idea of it, but it's just a bubble like anything else. Ethereum is down forty six percent in June, down sixty eight percent in Q two. Um, so. And, and again, these technical analysts are like still trying to pick a bottom in this thing. My long-term forecast remains down. Yeah, you can get these bounces. You, you can always get these 10, 15% bounces and things. Um, but uh, to me, primary trend down, Bitcoin, S&P, NASDAQ, earnings, economy, Ethereum, energy, peaking, uh, brand new. It's got the most gains on the year. I think... Um, if you're looking for the the f most fresh short idea, you're talking about energy. Okay, energy stocks overowned. It's everybody's favorite long. When they wouldn't touch it with a ten foot pole, now it, it's they can't get enough of it. Right? Uh, yeah. Already down twenty. Yeah, Michael, let me interrupt you for one second before yeah. people hack you, as I know they will. I'm just going to clarify right now. Right now, I'm, I'm going to anyone who asks this question is going to be thrown off the stage. If anyone says well, Michael says they're over owned, but it's only 4% of the S&P. Don't take that literally, okay? Mm -hmm. Take it figuratively. And, 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 and so and I would just say the amount of hostility, without mentioning names, three aces, um, you started sounding the uh, signal, sounding the, the alarm on energy a few weeks ago. And I can just tell you, I mean, the vitriol that I was subjected to because I sold my energy stocks, Three and so your point about Michael, like you want to fade what what people the consensus trades, and I see Javier. Javier, you got to get up here. That's a fundamental perspective on this as well. Javier was the smartest energy guy in the, that comes in these rooms. He was warning about this three weeks ago. And Aces, could you just do that? Many many names, just share with the room the type of feedback you got from people when you said you weren't feeling too good about energy. Three Aces. Yeah, I mean George, I don't know if you remember, but it was all the way back when the steel and the neon conversations and i was trying to tell people that you know the business cycle's over and at the end of the business cycles where the commodities do the best and the everything bubble was coming in with the endless liquidity and you saw elliot and associates what they did with nickel and the rest of it and i said there's a huge air pocket here in all of them and then you know start talking about oil without even getting into individual stock names, I mean, one death threat after the next from our friends, you know, north of the border. And, we're not, no, we're not going to mention yeah. this. I will, I will just right. say, so. It's unbelievable. It, well, you know, it's, and, and I'm going to pick a fight. I'm not looking to pick a fight. I'm asking for a little maturity and objectivity. I just kind of know, notice that the, the more we don't trump at the bullish case for energy, the fewer of these people show up in these rooms and, you know, people can do with that what they want. So, Michael, what you were saying, though, 100 percent. I mean, the amount of pushback that Ace has got from saying anything less than max bullish on energy or ditto from myself. Couldn't agree with you more, Michael. Go ahead. I just had, I just had to had to put that in there. I want to give you a second for you to collect your thoughts and rest of Michael. Back, back to you, Michael. Yeah, sure. So that's that's the overall view. Um, so basically, the the world is going into an economic downturn. They pulled stimulus and. Um, stimulus was responsible for pumping up the bubble. Hey, Michael, the stimulus. Can you shut yeah. Off? You have a phone right in the background. Yeah, it's all, it, it's over right now. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. I'm technologically challenged here. <laughs> Maybe we'll get. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask Elon Musk when he buys Twitter <laughs> to, to put it on a computer so I don't have to talk on my phone. All right, let me, uh, go ahead, Mike. Keep going. Go ahead. Um, okay, so economy global economy down um it, it's just very simple so um you, you know that feeds back into energy demand by the way I, i've been following energy very closely and if you see there were 
they put all the sanctions on Russia, right? Eliminate Russian oil from the market. That was the idea. Sorry, didn't work. If you look at what's the stories, China and India are totally loading up on ch on Russian cheap Russian oil. So it's not like the Russian oil has disappeared from the market. Um, uh, by the way, something else I want to mention that's extremely important about energy. So I follow emerging markets, <clears throat> excuse me, and frontier markets very closely. And if you um, if you uh, this is in the Belkin report, uh, page eight, I believe, is the the chart page for EM. Yeah, uh, the only emerging markets that were going up until about a month ago were oil plays: Saudi Arabia, UAE, Kuwait, Qatar, etc. Um, they peaked right around right before energy peaked. So um, huge inflows into Saudi Arabia and all these uh, EM and FM uh, oil play markets. They have started to roll over. They are shorts. So here's another oil play. If, if you can figure out a way to short Saudi Arabia, you know, it's, it's the biggest oil company in the world, right? I don't know where it trades. Um, but uh, Kuwait, <clears throat> all these things, uh, it's a global phenomena. They started rolling over before the price of energy peaked. And what I suspect is, <clears throat> now, if you look at the, the news headlines, it, you know, inflation is so bad. It's a, at Biden, you know, uh, we got Powell's up there. Inflation is so bad. I have to keep raising interest rates. <laughs> but, you know, this is the guy who was saying last year, we're not even thinking about thinking about raising interest rates. I mean, you can't get more wrong than the Federal Reserve has been. While they were pumping up inflation and all these commodities were zooming and I was long them, he was saying, uh, we're not even thinking about thinking about raising interest. Now, uh, now that inflation has probably peaked or is in the process of peaking, you know, base metals are declining, uh, energy prices declining, grains are declining. They can't what are they what's the fed talking about doing we got to keep raising interest rates cuz inflation is so bad these guys are so out to lunch um and so and also biden so biden we've got to lower the price of, of crude energy we've got to lower the price of oil my my, my ratings are so low we got to do that. anyways so <clears throat> the point is these guys are so out to lunch what is probably going to happen is they are going it's going to work so whatever Biden, the, and it, the way the markets are set up at the moment, what Biden wants to do is to get more oil flowing from Saudi Arabia. So I think if they do something like that, like Iran, et cetera, Venezuela, more energy from more uh, production from OPEC, things like that, it's going to work. It's going to drive the oil price down at this point in the cycle. Um, now, we have to talk about psychology. Okay, psychology of the market is completely messed up. Okay, so every like I was just making fun of Biden and and Powell. So the the psychology in the market is in, inflation is so bad, interest rates are going up. It's bad for tech stocks. If only inflation peaks, then and the energy price goes down, then everything will be rosy again because we'll be off to the races. You know. Okay, to me that is dead wrong. Let me give you an example. So uh, in, bear with me one second, please. Um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, okay, so in 2008, um, the, energy, the oil price went from $68 in July to $142. In July 2007, this was the last severe recession that we had, right? Uh, went from 68 to 142, doubled, right? Uh, peaked in July 2008 while the mo stock market was already going down. It made a total round trip, went from 142 to 68 as the economy weakened. So let me give, give you an example of what happened. Um, during the latter part of the crude oil round trip, when it peaked in July, went from 142 to down to, um, it, it, it fell in half. The federal fund's interest rate was cut by 175 basis points from 2% to 0.25%, and the S&P 500 fell by 46%, and quarterly S&P 500 operating earnings declined by 41%. So I'm anticipating a somewhat similar scenario to that, a severe recession, economic downturn, decline for commodities, um, decline for oil, 
uh, decline in corporate earnings, interest rates, which the Fed is, says is, are going to keep going up. They're probably, <clears throat> I mean, they're fighting the last war. Yeah, they'll probably raise another time or two. But everything is going to reverse. And w the point is, psychology is completely messed up right now in the market. What investors think is the problem isn't the problem. And what they think is the answer is the problem. So the economy, all this stuff going down means the economy is going down, earnings are going down, the stock market's going down, and this is going to persist for the next 12 to 18 months. So, Michael, that's, uh, that's, that's quite a powerful tour de force, really, really well spoken. Um, before we get to questions from the audience, let me ask, throw a couple questions at you. So you made it very clear. Energy, I think, was top of mind. Uh, as you know, that's what you focused on this week. And I know that's where you look at change at the margin. That's where it seems to be the, the biggest amount of cognitive dissonance, the biggest amount of uncertainty. Michael, could you speak to, uh, let's talk about the yen a little bit, and about JGBs, and also about uh, European bond spreads. And those are, you know, not top of mind for most people. People suffer generally from proximity bias. They focus on what's closest to them. But, you know, those things are rumbling in the background and could be the source of, uh, the next big upset. So could you just speak a little bit about what do you see going on with JGBs, Japanese bond yields and the yen and, and also um, with the euro and uh, European sovereign spreads? Thank you, Michael. OK, um, I'm 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 sort of obviously last time I came on, somebody asked me where could the yen dollar yen go to? And I said, well, it went up 10. It could go up another 10 or 20 yen. So we're kind of there now. I mean, it's overshooting. Obviously, the Bank of Japan is fighting the tape. Their their policy is no longer appropriate. You know, endlessly supporting bond prices. Um, they're getting blown out of the water. I'm kind of agnostic on it, though. Um, I, I, I'm not. I think it's a crowded trade. I think the hedge funds are kind of attacking that, shorting JGBs and buying dollar yen. Um, I think it's a little bit tired. Um, I think yeah, they could get blown out, but the bigger, you know. The dollar to me, okay, last time I came on, I said maybe commodities are topping uh, and energy is topping. This time, uh, I, you're talking to somebody that's been long the dollar for a long time, okay? The dollar up signal is running out of steam, okay? In my work, it's not quite a short yet. So I have the dollar as a long, more versus EM currencies, Mexican peso, Brazilian real, things like that. So um, in terms of credit spreads, you ask about credit spreads, those are widening. Um, but treasuries are the flip side of that. So if, if, if credit spreads in Europe and in the U.S., junk bond spreads, mortgage spreads, et cetera, uh, EM spreads, those are widening. That can be bullish for U.S. treasuries. So it gets back to long TLT. If you're looking for an opportunistic bounce in something, um, treasury bonds, uh, I think, are the solution. There's one potential that could be a big rally. By the way, 87 crash. I was at Solomon Brothers. Uh, a big pension fund liquidated all their stocks through us. The, tra the trading floor was paralyzed for days. We weren't getting transaction reports back. Everything was a mess. Um, and... All of a sudden, bonds, if you w remember back into 87, the bonds sold off, sold off, sold off. The bonds went down 20%. Uh, percent. And uh, everybody was wondering at the time, when is it going to crack the stock market? When is it going to crack the stock market? Well, it finally did. The stock market topped out, I believe, in September, sold off, bounced back a little bit, peaked in August, bounced back in September, rolled over, and you had the 87 crash in, Oct in mid-October. Um, <clears throat> At that time, bonds took off like crazy. So I'm a little, to answer your question, I would be a little hesitant on, on shorting any government bonds at this point in time in major markets. Yeah, um, Mike, yeah Mike, you know, it's really funny to hear you. I'm just chuckling because we've all been there before. You get, you get in a position, we've all done it. And, and one of the things I like about your, your rigor, your, your, the, pro, the, the, the rigor of your process so guards against complacency, but you know, you talk about getting along with bonds, everyone is short. Short, you know, selling energy, a lot of people still like it. It's the old hit them where they ain't. I just want to invoke the old story for and Michael. I, I don't know how much of a baseball story I am, but I'm a baseball nut. There was a famous baseball player uh, called Wee Willie Keeler who uh, played from 1892 to uh, 1910. Um, 
mostly for the Baltimore Orioles, later on for the uh, New York Highlanders, as they were then called. And he was one of the greatest hitters of all time. Uh, in fact, I'm just looking here at the wiki. I, I didn't realize this about him. He had the highest ratio of career at bats to strikeouts. In other words, he struck out less per at bat than any other any other player that played that you know, had a certain amount of at bats. But he had a saying. They would ask him. He was a southerner. And they asked him, they said, well, why are you such a good hitter? And then with this heavy southern drawl, he said, well, I hit him where they ain't. <laughs> I hit him where they ain't. <laughs> and that's kind of like Wall Street, you know? Like, we try to make it all complicated with all these formulas and P ratios and, you know, charts and this and that and everything else. Well, it's kind of like the fashion business, really. It's like, you know, just hit them where they ain't, all right? So you just look for where the crowded trade is. You don't want to be an asshole contrarian just for the sake of being an asshole contrarian. But what I love about your work is you're often highlighting, you know, what's there to see in the plain light of day. But the problem is because of participant bias, we all just miss it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, wouldn't that be a hoot? I mean, you know, the last few days, your energy's given up the ghost and, 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 and bonds are rallying. Wouldn't that be a hoot if, like, for the next few months, like, it's like, you know, Dustin Hoffman, the graduate, you know, when they ask him, well, you know, one thing, just one thing, plastics. Okay, well, Belkin, what is it? Well, two things, just two things, long bond, short energy. I mean, and that is so running in the face of what the street is saying right now. That would be, and Michael, that wouldn't be the first time what, that you've seen something like that, would it? No. Uh, so, by the way, if you overlay uh, treasury yields with the oil price, it's a pretty close tracking correlation. Um, so the, it fits together uh, energy demand, you know, e e function of stronger economy, um, uh, interest rates going up. That's been the story in the rearview mirror, right? And um, I guess, you know, my advantage or problem, depending on how you look at it, is I look at a forward forecast. So I was very, uh, you know, I was very unsatisfied with what I learned in econometrics in business school. So that's what drove me to spend my time in, in a, a, you know, a time series analysis statistics class and w along with physics majors and engineering majors um, who, would, you know, it's a form of analysis that looks at cycles, basically, you know, it looks, you know, they use it for the way, for way wind goes over the wing of an airplane or a rocket or something. But, um, Anyways, I am looking at how things are supposed to change. My, again, forecast. And I'm amazed, what the heck is the central bank of the United States, what are they using for forecasts? Like, so when, when Powell was saying, we're not even thinking about thinking about raising interest rates, it was so bloody obvious. I mean, my work, I was long all these commodities and energy and energy stocks, and you know, the CPI was zooming, and these guys were saying, we're not going to raise interest. What? The, like with the Federal Reserve, it employs thousands. It, I mean, they they recruit people from Berkeley. You know, I mean, you you get all these PhDs. They have hundreds and thousands of, of PhDs. What the heck are these guys using for forecasting? They're total idiots. Like they didn't see this coming. They're creating inflation. They they didn't see it. Hello. Now that everything's turning down, they say inflation is a problem. What are they looking at as a yeah, forecast? Yeah, yeah, Michael, 100%. I mean, Jay Powell, the man without a plan. So, so let's just hold it right there. This has been awesome. You've been on fire as usual. Let's go. To, we got some smart cookies up on street. Hey, George, can I ask Michael a quick question before we go? Or do you want to start with the other folks? Yeah, ask him a quick question, and then we'll go to the other. Yeah. Go ahead. Hey, hey, Mike, thanks a lot for coming. Um, and you're you know, you always just take the words right out of my mouth, and I appreciate it. Um, but I'm just curious about something. So here we are. We're in the situation we're in at the macro level and so on and so forth. You know, in past cycles, you know, pre-Frankenstein, you know, Fed Reserve, no recession, you know, no downturn world, um, you know, the, the stock market leadership changed. Right. Well, these, you know, by, from, at the sector level, you know, at the very least, you know, when the new when we came out of the, the old cycle into the new, we had a whole new leadership of 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 things. Um, but, you know, the trick that, that seems to me that the Silicon Valley fraudsters and the investment banks played on the markets this time around was everything was a tech stock, you know, beyond meat. Oh. You know, tech, Wayfair, furniture retailer, tech, Carvana, tech, Tesla, tech. Tesla's an automotive. So, so what happened now is you got 
30 some odd, 40 percent. Uh, John Roke's very good at that stuff. Percentage of the mar- of the whole set of the whole stock market is tech, right? So so now we're you know going away with the old business cycle and old market structure, and at some point here entering into the new business cycle, new market structure. I mean, is it possible now that we're stuck with everything as a goddamn tech stock leadership for the rest of our lives? Or could could you see that changing in some way? Thank you. Yeah, good question. Um, So uh, the model's really pretty good at sector rotation. Um, And so going back six, eight months ago, the best, the model's best short ideas were all the, you know, Carvana software stocks, um, you know, Zoom, all the things that were big pandemic winners that were trading at 30, 40, 50 times revenues. To put that in perspective, the S&P peaked at 3.6 times revenues, which was an all-time high. It's down a bit from that now. But these, these software stocks were trading at 10, 20 times the uh, all-time high S&P rev- price, you know, revenue to price r- ratio. Um, so um, those, to get bring it, uh, tie it up to the present, um, those stocks are still on my short list. Not all of them, but they're down huge, right? So I get asked this a lot. Um, is it, is there, you know, is it time? Big hedge fund guys keep asking me this. Is it time to cover our, you know, I don't even know if they're short these things, but they see them down. Is it time to buy them yet? No, (laughs) they're sort of um, kind of in the baton death march to me, you know, like these things they're you know, like what happened in the, after the 2000 TMT tech bubble top, they ended up going down 90%. So some of these are down 50, 60, 70%. Yeah, they could bounce a little, but um, you know, tech on the other hand, the, fang stocks they're still up okay fang extended fang uh you know tesla um microsoft uh those to me are still great shorts so i like uh tesla to me is my is the number one short sorry elon you know um seem like a nice guy and i hope it works out with twitter but uh um the stock you know the stock is still up enormously, and it has huge downside risk, even to the 200-week average. Not, not, let's not even talk about the 200-month average. So we got Fang still way up in the stratosphere, over-owned. Uh, it's underperformed. You know, one after another is broke. You know, Facebook broke, Netflix broke, um, Amazon broke. We still got Microsoft, Tesla, Google up there. Um, uh, but those are, sh- those are strong recommended shorts in my model forecast. Um, now, let me just tie this off to answer your question. There's a way to take advantage of this. If the tech thing, if the tech liquidation is going to continue, you know, relentlessly, you know, with ba- inter- re- interrupted by bounces, um, there's a way you can take uh, sleep at night. If, if you're a smart, sophisticated hedge fund or individual investor, you can be market neutral. Okay, so long XLU, XLP, XLV. That's XLU utilities, XLP staples, XLV healthcare. Short and equal amount XLK. Or here's one for you, SMH, semiconductors. What the heck are they doing up there? Semiconductors are like the energy stocks of the, of the tech world, right? So semiconductors, um, you know, the, the argument is shortages. How can you sell them? The earnings are so going to be so great. Blah, blah. Uh-uh. Semiconductors. Um, I have one client explain to me on semiconductors, symbol O-N. It, it's just a generic, they make crappy semiconductors, nothing special, you know. The stock is like in the moon. What is it doing up there? You know, I mean, so the shortages, as the economic cycle turns down, these things that, that look like shortages are going to turn into gluts. Um, and it's so far from the psychology of the market. I sound like a, a lunatic saying that probably to most people, but that's the process that we're in. So uh, the, get back to the idea. If you want to you wanna just have pure alpha, short tech, short, say, semiconductors, SMH, things like that, short energy, OIH, XLE, long, really boring chicken longs, XLP, staples. So have a market neutral position. All you care about is what happens in relative terms between those two positions. I think you could. that's a double digit percentage potential gain easily. Um, looking out six, 12 months, it's a sleep at night trade, less volatile. Um, as you, It's a way to take advantage of 
the consensus as it goes from, oh my God, I'm, I'm long all these economically sensitive stocks. By the way, um, fresh this week, chemicals, short, Belkin report, new position, paper forest products, short, agriculture stocks, short, you know, things, fertilizer stocks, those are all shorts. But uh, anyways, you can have a, a basket of the stuff that's the most advanced and the stuff that's the most depressed. And the psychology, as the psychology of the market changes from, uh, oh my God, it, it's the inflation, it's so bad, da, 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 to, oh my God, the economy is weird. Oh my God. Inflation. All right, Mike, Michael, you're breaking Instead up. Of being good Michael. for tech. Hey, Michael, yeah. you're breaking up. Michael, you're okay. breaking up. Okay. Yeah, it's better. Okay. We lost you in the last ten. We lost you in the last ten seconds. Okay. Yeah. How, am I back now? Yeah, you're good. Got me. Okay. So, yep, anyways, the psychology yep, yeah. market neutral. I, 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 I recommend for people who can hack it. Like you got to get your head around spreads. A lot of people. Some of my clients just don't get it. They can't be market neutral. They can't. They think it's not absolute gain. It is an absolute gain. Even if you lose money on your longs, if you make more money on your shorts, the the overall net of the position is a positive double double digit percentage gain. So that's what I like: short tech, long defensive uh, for sleep at night trade. You know, six, twelve, eighteen month view. Thanks, Michael. All right. So now let's. Uh, that's great. It's fantastic. <laughs> Got a lot of really smart people in the room. Let's get on with the questions. We're going to go first to Emma, then to Kay Fab, then to Dave Nikoski, and then to Lynn. Emma, good to see you. What's on your mind, Emma? So I just had uh, one quick thing. You mentioned um, Bel. Is, sorry, is your first name Belkin or is it Michael or is it Actually, Michael? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's Michael <laughs> Belkin. Yes, Michael Belkin. Okay, Michael. So um, you mentioned that if you overlay energy on TLT, you get the same thing because I I put a chart in there. And that's year to date. It looks like they're like kind of opposite. No, you see, you know, Emma is just it's, it's, it's saying the same thing, just definitionally. The inverse of TLT. So is, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, okay. yeah. So that's, that's what he's saying. So, so um, I guess the the inverse TLT is what TMF or something. I can't remember what it is. TBT, whatever. So if you, just, if you just flip TYX. it TYX. Yeah. Sorry, which one, Michael? Which one? TYX. TYX is the yield. Yeah, the yield goes up and down with um. The, yeah. The, the, yeah. yeah, no, we're, we're good. We're good. All right, let's, yeah. let's move on. I was trying to put a one over it, but I don't know how to do it in Bloomberg. Uh, but I, now I got it. It says you said TYX. Yeah. Thank you. All right, that's cool. All right, let's go to KFAB, then Dave McCoskin, then Lenny. Hey, Dave, KFAB, great to see you. What's up? Thanks, George. Uh, great to speak with you again, Michael. Um, I, I think the obvious uh, recency bias is to look at 08. But you, you've said some words that uh, I also heard from uh, Ekery, who came out with a global recession call publicly a couple of weeks ago. And in 2008, we didn't have a global recession. Um, and, and oil demand was only down, I think, less than 2% year over year during that, that economic downturn. Uh, you have to go back to the early 80s for a global recession. And, and crude oil was actually down about 7%. Uh, in year over year demand uh, through the kind of double recession. So w I know your, your work goes back that far, I believe, to the uh, the 70s even. So and anything that strikes you about, I mean, obviously these periods are always uh, echoing. They're not the exact same. Um, but how do you think about the idea of a global recession, what that might mean relative to your models? Um, and, and just kind of generally, because, again, I think everyone's kind of anchored in the 08 analog for obvious reasons, um, when I think global recession is a co completely different animal. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are. I guess it could be worse. You're right. So um, if if that was more U.S. centric 2008 from from the credit crisis um, right now, <laughs> obviously, I mean, today, for instance, European I mentioned this before, manufacturing PMI, uh, 52, down from 54.6. Services PMI, 52.8, down from 56. Those are huge drops. And they're right teetering. They're close to the 50 line. So um, I do agree we're probably headed into a global economic contraction. And it's a result um, of the stimulus, of overstimulus, right? And then pulling the stimulus away and now tightening. It's kind of obvious what's happening. So, uh, yeah, global um, 
you, you know, this is, I am not an expert on, say, European um, natural gas demand. Uh, so natural gas has been spiking in Europe. It's been selling off here, if you look at it. So um, this is a, it's a very complicated global picture. Um, I, I, you probably have better insights than I do on this. But I just think the trend is down. Again, I'm looking at a forecast. My, my, everything I look is what's supposed to happen next, not the rear view mirror. And um, the model looks for turning points. And it caught this turning point in the global economy. So by the way, you know, Q1 GDP was down, not much in the US, real GDP, mostly because inflation was up. Um, we are about almost over, you know, next week, end of Q2 in the US. And um, the corporate earnings reports warnings are about to start big time. So that's really something to keep an eye on. You know, I, I think Wall Street is completely out to lunch. On fact set, what, what they are looking for in earnings, I'm collecting stories on this now. One of the things I do in the report is press clips. And er, fact set says, I mean, um, the the expectations for earnings are just completely wrong. Like the, the uh, stocks, analysts have the most buy ratings buy ratings on stocks right now um, on almost on record, according to FactSet. Where do they come up with this stuff? Like the economy's headed south. So what you can say for sure is there are going to be downgrades. The companies are going to warn. The analysts will say, oh, I'm wrong. I'm downgrading the stock earnings expectations from 260 to 220. It's like a whole tidal wave of that kind of stuff. And then you have the at the end of the food chain of this, you've got these portfolio managers, long only portfolio managers, who wait for the analysts who are brain dead to tell them what to do with the stocks when they, uh, when they should already see what I'm seeing in this forecast, which is the economy's headed down, earnings are headed down. So anyway, we are headed into a major um, revision cycle downgrade and um, globally as well as US. So by the way, so I have, you know, let me just give you an example. Uh, maybe we're not supposed to talk about stocks, but I, I added this week forest products, containers and packaging, chemicals, auto finance. There are just amazing stock short ideas out there. Alley, A L L Y, you know, major um, subprime auto lender, a a auto finance company, chemicals, H U N, DuPont, containers and packaging. BLL, Forest Products, LPX, WY, Agriculture, UAN, IPI, uh, retailers. Have, I mean, already the retailers are already telling you this, right? Target says inventories are too high. Hello? That's what a recession is. It's an inventory liquidation cycle. Target and Walmart are already telling you this. I mean, what are people thinking? Why don't they get the picture of this? Coal stocks, they're in the stratosphere looking for an energy short. BTU. These, um, the, the coal stocks went to the moon. They're just rolling over from a high level. What about retail meme stocks? God, Revlon. Anybody look at this? This, thing, this stock just went from up 700% or something, declared bankruptcy. The retail meme crowd buys um, Revlon <laughs> after bankruptcy. God bless them, you know. But I mean, that's the psychology of what's going on out there. The, a, an economic down cycle is going to just swamp all this stuff, right? So I like, I like cyclicals is short, energy stocks is short, fertilizer stocks is short, asset managers. Oh, one thing I didn't mention here. Um, okay, I don't want to, this is sensitive territory. Uh, anyways, let's just say uh, <laughs> KKR, you know, Blackstone, the businesses like this that have been, their business depends on selling junk bonds and flipping companies for the most part. You know, they're asset managers as well. But um, if you pull out, these stocks are in the stratosphere. Look at KKR, uh, you know, look at stocks like that. They started to roll over, but they're still way, way up. In this, and people consider them to be quality companies. You know, I tell this to my clients, I get pushback. You're shorting Blackstone, well, yeah, that's a great company. Schwartzman is so smart. No, 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 no. Anyways, um, I'm just saying they're in the path of liquidation. So uh, drunk bond spreads are widening. Um, <clears throat> dealers are stuck with um, bridge loans. This is happening. I mean, hello, this is like 2008 all over again. All of a sudden, they can't sell, they can't get rid of, they took, you know, um, they took big percentage slices of these loans for these deals. And now they, so they can't do deals anymore. The deal financing is drying up. Bad 
for asset managers, bad for junk bond shops, uh, bad for stockbrokers, Morgan Stanley, um, Goldman Sachs. Hello, these are shorts in my work. Financials are short. So economy down, it kind of takes all boats down, you know, and um, sort of a roundabout way of answering your question, but it just affects a lot of things in, in group and sector rotation uh, that are economically sensitive and that have been basically milking the bubble. If you're a company that's been milking stimulus and milking the bubble, you've got problems. Thanks, Michael. That's terrific. By the way, just a quick uh, commercial message here. Again, I have no commercial relationship with Michael. I do not stand to benefit one way or the other. I will just tell you, I've been reading the Belkin Report for over 30 years. I think, Michael, I think you like to tell people the story. I was your very first subscriber. Michael is, um, you know, he's had more than his fair share of uh, outrageous calls. He certainly is an out of consensus thinker. You don't need another, um, you know, consensus institutional speak from the street, particularly in markets like this. Uh, Michael, uh, I'd reach out to Michael or reach out to uh, Hyperpron at Hyperpron, H Y P E R P R O N, if you want to inquire about becoming a subscriber. Um, Michael has a high-end product for big institutions. He also offers a, uh, a, 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 a the Belkin Light Report stripped down version of that, which has been incredibly well received. Uh, I, I know a lot of people have subscribed to Michael's work, having heard him um, uh, come in this space uh, two, three, four times in the last couple of months. Really helped out a lot of people. Um, you know, when people say, "Well, gee, you know, it costs whatever it costs," and we're not talking anything that's going to break the bank. When people think about just for the average investor, if they have a portfolio of a few hundred thousand dollars or maybe some of the more middle-aged boomers, a few million dollars, and you think about all the fees you're paying, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. I mean, what Michael charges for his service is an extraordinary, extraordinary bargain. So reach out to him or better yet, reach out to uh, at Hyperprom, H-Y-P-E-R-P-R-O-N. I think it's for the money. It's like the best report out there. All right, let's move on. Uh, we're going to go now to Dave Nikoski and then Gilbert. And then Lynn. Dave, good to see you. What's up, my friend? Hey, how you doing? Thanks for having me on. Michael, great job. I completely agree with you. A um, couple of weeks ago when I was on, I suggested that, you know, energy at $120 a barrel was quite expen- extended from the 200 day and indicated, you know, 92 or 93 would be, you know, a better place somewhere, you know, in the 100 to $92 would, would definitely be a, a desirable place to take new positions. Um, just from the extension. So I can completely agree with you. Um, I, I, I'm still a bear overall. And, you know, I don't see uh, much that, that I can say is looks great. Um, you know, I put out a uh, biotech piece the other day, um, seeing a number of, you know, and one of the areas, just to give you an idea, when you look at that 08 low in our own proprietary um uh, groups within healthcare, and so we rank large cap biotech, mi- you know, mid cap, small cap, and micro cap. You know, it was interesting to note at that time that micro cap biotechs actually bottomed in November and proceeded on a rel- relative strength basis to to absolutely go up versus the market on an absolute and relative basis. Um, you know, so I, I, I like I like to look at the most speculative things uh, at turning points to see if. Money flows are coming in. Um, you certainly saw JNK. I've been highlighting JNK and MBB, which is the mortgage-backed securities, and they've all seen a bounce. Um, a few weeks ago, I put out, you know, JNK was actually outperforming the S&P, which is typical, and you saw that in March uh, during the, the COVID, when uh, the COVID lows that JNK started to outperform once everyone had uh, vanquished them from their portfolios. Um, usually you get a, you know, an up spike for so, several weeks and we're starting to see JNK, at least on a relative basis, come down from, uh, from its peak here re- more recently at the market lows. Um, I, I think that, you know, as, as we go on, I agree with you hundred percent, you're going to see earnings numbers are, are way off the board and I'm, I'm a technician, but you know, I can't believe that we aren't seeing at least, uh, more companies bring those earnings down. You know, on the other side of the coin, on, on looking at energy pulling back, you know, I would expect that, you know, the first play we, place we should get some signs of life uh, and usually always starts at a turning point is is the retail names. I know we're far from it. We're in perfect downtrends, but 
something to pay attention to. You know, the consumer is roughly 70 percent of the economy. We should start to at least, you know, in the next several months, start to see some inflections. I think the good thing for for the consumer is, you know, I walked into Costco the other day and the amount of prices that they had knocked down and put the 97 cents on, on the end of them would suggest at least that they're trying to clear out the inventory. So uh, and, and at least, uh, you know, they're going to hurt their margins. But I think that's beneficial for the consumer to uh, go through the durable goods area and Costco, probably roughly 50 percent of their uh, real estate is dedicated to that. So I think you know, looking at the, at, at it that from that perspective, we could actually see at least some some inflation come down on, on durable goods uh, front to the retail. So, you know, I, I, we will get through this. Everything will end up at some point being OK. I, you know, the, the Fed is uh, it, great at manipulating the market and doing things like QE. I don't expect them to do that again. Um, but, you know, th- this will end. Um, you know, there's a lot of fear in the market. There's no doubt. Um, you know, biotechs, as I said, you know, looking at something like a biogen, you know, you know you're at six month relative strength highs. The, you, biotechs have underperformed the market well in advance of the market peak. You said the same thing with China and China is certainly, you know, in the process. Bottoms are processes. They take time to deliver. Um, as, as we suggested before, uh, you know, with China and India be, being able to buy, you know, Russian crude at a discount and sending us match- manufactured goods, uh, utilizing that Russian crude, you know, the, the sanctions absolutely failed and, and no one's going, no one from the other side is going to acknowledge it. You know, we have to look at it and every headline we see suggests that, you know, we did the right thing and, uh, you know, the right thing and, coming out the way we want it are two different things. Um, I, I do believe that long term we do have an energy problem, but I, I think oil is going to probably collapse through that 92 level and, uh, you know, upset a lot of people that are taking positions there. You saw the same thing in 08, you know, but it rallied right back. So uh, I still think that we need some type of washout to, you know, expend any bulls out there. And uh, it's going to take time. It's a process. So, um, look, Dave, love it, man. Great comments. Sounds like you and Michael are kind of on the same page. I have to say, though, I'm saying this in a teasing way, um, yeah. Dave. You really triggered me by something you said. Um, I'm, I'm saying this in a teasing way. I'm not taking issue with you, but you That's triggered okay. me. You triggered me. Um, <laughs> and that is because everyone, if you look at the tweet I put up in the nest, I'm actually going to play the audio. When you said it'll all be all okay in the end, I don't know what it is. It's like you got to be, you know, make your clients feel good, not you. But people, people can't deal with bad news. Yeah, we'll get through this. I get it. But you triggered me insofar as um, yeah. Ross Gerber the other day. I'm just going to play the audio just for a minute so people can hear it. It's like this is just I, I want to shoot myself in the mouth. Listen to this guy. Hold on one second. We just play this one second. But the U.S. economy we're celebrating. We're celebrating today because the world isn't so bad. The world isn't so bad. And so the economy is doing just fine. The Fed has raised their rates. The economy is going to slow. Stocks and bonds are cheap. Okay? And we're going to get through this period of time. The light's at the end of the tunnel. We're going to get through this period of time. Got to hold on a little bit longer. We're going to see a little bit more volatility. Got a couple more Fed meetings. And by 23, we're good. We're good. So going <laughs> yeah. in, in, in all reality, I mean, I'm looking for like a 2700 on the S&P. Okay. So, by the, I, sorry. So <laughs> when I say it's all good, I mean, it's a process. Nikoski, 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 it's not about you. Don't be taking defense. Yeah. It's just, it's just I don't know, Belkin can't control himself. <laughs> so, because he's not muted, he can't stop laughing. Sorry to hurt you, Michael. This Ross Goober guy, though, you got to follow this guy. He is money. I mean, and you watch this guy, and the unbelievable thing, I don't know what's happened to his assets lately, but you go back like a year or so ago, this guy's being held out as a genius. I think he's running a few hundred million, couple billion or whatever. I mean, I just want him, my head just explodes. I mean, this is the kind of crap that people listen to. I mean, so, so, so Dave, let me ask you this. When you talk to yeah. clients, like, you know, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not attacking you. Don't take it that way. Yeah. Okay? But it just, no. this is the kind of nonsense that goes on in the public square. Like, what's your reaction to stuff like this? 
Well, I, I I think they're they're outlandish, and when I say they're going to be okay, I'm not suggesting that we're going to hold in here at these levels. I I think we go to 2700, 2750, and we could we could take that out by 10. percent You know, when you look back at the November 08 lows, you know, I remember sitting in my office after we rallied off that 08 low, and I looked at my teammates and I said, you know, often in a, a secular bear market, you'll undercut those lows by 10%. And one of my coworkers had, who had a calculator punched it in and looked at us and said, that's 666 on the S&P 500. <laughs> and I said, we are not putting that in print. True story. We all kind of laughed because we're a little, you know, a godly bunch of group uh, in the office. And I said, I'm not putting that in writing. The day of the low, as we looked at it, she looked, she looked at me and she said, Dave, it was at 666. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think we can get to a 3000 level really easy. I, I think a 2700 print to take that out is going to send us all to the sidelines. You know, when the, when the market does come to, you know, the lows, no one's going to want to buy. You know, it's that's just you're going to remove anyone that thinks that the market is not but, the they, biggest they, they, casino. They, they, they want to interrupt 100 percent, 100 percent. Hey, hey, Michael, you, have you stopped laughing yet? Like, <laughs> what, do you to, what do you say to Ross Gerber, Michael? <laughs> that's a uh, it's a great one. Um, it's right up there with Kramer. I know. Unreal. All right. Let's keep moving here. Stay on stage, Dave, because there'll be questions for you. I know people want to talk to okay. you. I want to go to Gilbert and then Dorian. Hey, Gilbert, what's up? Or Gilberto, what's up? Hey, George. I'm really, what's really... Ah, it's everything good here in the Dominican Republic. Good weather. Everything is fine. I want to ask Michael, but first I want to acknowledge and tell him I really admire his harmonious and well-organized way of thinking and how he expresses his ideas. It's really delightful to be in the audience. And I would like him to answer uh, what is his view on the Chinese tech versus U.S. tech, if that spread between FXI, KWeb, Long, Short, QQQ has any merit versus a uh, possible alternative, like what he uh, pointed before, the Staples, Long, Short, Tech. And in in general, I would like him to let me know what his foresight 12 months in the future for South Koreans, Asian, and Chinese markets, especially tech. Okay. Um, now, here's one for you. So remember I told you um, S&P 500, the, the downside target in a bear market is the 200-month average. And that's not ridiculous. That's not a conspiracy theory thing. We got there. Back, you know, the 666 the, that, that uh, guy, guy just mentioned, that was right below the 200-month average. So at the bottom of bear markets, it gives you a general target about where things could go. That level is 2,068 for the S&P 500, down 44%. So my target is so ridiculously low. You know, but I get laughed out of what, you know, people's offices probably for saying that. But um, so here's one for you. The Chinese... Uh, MSCI Emerging Market Index in U.S. dollars is on its 200-month average. Okay, so it's had the retracement all the way down that I'm predicting for the S&P and the Nasdaq. The S the Chinese market is already there. Now that doesn't mean it's going straight up. Like that's trend analysis. Trend analysis doesn't tell you where the market's going. It just tells you when something has had a retracement. So China, uh, in terms of, uh, in that index, that's um, Chinese uh, stocks that are listed in Hong Kong. They're investable for U.S. investors. So that's a fully investable index. I'm not, I I'm waiting for it. I don't have a buy on it yet. And I, I'm, it kind of bugs me because Wall Street is now bullish on China, right? If you say one thing people want to buy, the brokers are saying buy China, Deutsche Bank, et cetera, you know, all these guys. Um, okay. I have to go with my model. The model isn't there yet, but it sees the potential for a bounce. But here is the big problem. Now, this has been going through my head. So I, as well as having my forecasting model, I'm an investment strategist, right? How do the pieces of the puzzle fit together? Now, look at what happened to Russia. Russia became, went from being a darling where you got to own, you know, 
Russian gold stocks, Polyus and Russian oil stocks, et cetera, to boom, it's gone. You can't, not only should you not own them, you can't sell them. <laughs> it's become completely and utterly uninvestable, Russia. So actually, you, you know, you can probably find a way around that and find bargains in, in depressed uh, Russian stocks, but that's another story. But anyways, as a Western investor, when war, when conflict strikes, it strikes and they put sanctions on, you get flushed, okay? So the question is, like, what's the next um, domino to fall in terms of global conflict? And we've got China, Taiwan sitting there. That makes me very, very tenuous. I'm wondering about what could China become basically off limits to Western investors because of sanctions. So you, you cannot rule anything out that this government does, right? You know, like the way that their sanctions crazy. So they'll cut, so I, you know, so if, if all of a sudden, you know, these, these Chinese flyovers, you've got, you know, all their, you know, 30 planes flying into Taiwanese airspace every other day these days, if something goes wrong accidentally, you know, something gets shot down or there's a collision or something leads to the next thing. And then, you know, you see these missiles fly, um, you know, that, that anti-ship missile sank the Russian cruiser, you know, like it wasn't even, like it was just a sitting duck. So a lot of these, these military assets, I don't want to go on and on about this because I'm not an expert, but I, I would be very cautious about the, the concept of Chinese stocks becoming sanctioned and becoming completely uninvestable. So that's, that's the, on the other side of the, the scale here is that Chinese stocks are very depressed. So I question is, I don't know. Right now, I do not. The model does not have a buy on China. Um, it could potentially be one approaching, but I'm very, very cautious about the potential for Chinese stocks becoming uninvestable due to sanctions in, uh, imposed by the U.S. and Europe. I think it's a trap, too. I mean, and there's been times when, when the Communist Party just doesn't like what's, what, where the capital is flowing, and they just say, oh, you're not getting your money back. Oh, we're just... Sorry, and they just close the markets. So it's like there's just a lot of binary events that don't go your way, it, you know. So I just see it as like too much downside relative to the potential upside. But agree with agree with that, Emma. Hey, uh, Michael, I think Gilberto had another question too. But just generally, where do you, Gilberto? Did you, did you have a question about tech or something aside from Chinese tech? Did you have a Did you have another question, Gilberto? Well, I really don't have. Another question, but I would like to, to add to the general knowledge that it's been sharing. A uh, reminder that when a couple months ago, I tell the history of what happened in the Dominican Republic in uh, 2003, 2005, with the crisis and inflation because of banking system crash. And it was really, really like what, how, what things been developing in the United States, but in a slower and bigger and more macro way. The late side, the late part of that cycle is pretty much what Michael was acknowledging with the TLT going up, the government bonds here in the Dominican Republic. It it happened just the same way, and in the final part of the crash, the relative outperformance of government bonds was like the sixty percent. Uh, when in a relative basis was before at 10%, so imagine it was sixfold, but it grew in terms of, of rentability. I just wanted to add that, and thanks, Michael, for his time, and, and George for his way of sharing the oral knowledge of trading and investment. Thank you, Gilberto. All right, let's go to uh, Dorian, and then we're going to go to uh, Holden Caulfieldberg. So, Dorian, what's up? Hey, George. Thanks for hosting another great space. Uh, Michael, really appreciate your commentary. Um, my problem is I actually agree with a lot of what you're saying. But <laughs> as a value investor, I, I struggle because you're picking on all my favorite uh, commodities. And, I, you know, I take a look at, and, and George knows I'm part of the comm, but, you know, I take a look, you know, the Canadian oil producers, even mentioned some coal guys and the fertilizer guys. And I'm looking at, okay, th these are things that even in a global recession, um, the, 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 they just seem so mispriced relative to where they should be. That I, well, I agree that sentiment can override valuation fundamentals. I still struggle with how do I how do I sell something that's you know trading at like one times earning um, when I still think that there's a long you know bull cycle ahead. I guess if you could help me with that, 
And then a follow on to that, I guess it's twofold. Um, if you if you could touch on uranium, because I don't think you've, you've you mentioned that yet. Um, and then I guess the, the follow on really is just has your model, you know, and I appreciate it's all forecasting, obviously, you know, you know, <laughs> you know I usually tell people my forecasts are plus or minus a thousand percent. But, you know, I guess how where does your model potentially go wrong in, in, in some of those fields? Appreciate it, Michael. Sure. Um, OK, so the, the problem with valuation and so uh, many of my clients are fundamental stock guys, s- such as yourself, it sounds like. Um, and um, they, they are looking at valuation models. And what, what the, the models um, sector and group forecast is something completely different than that. And um, as, you're pro- as I'm sure you're aware, valuation does not explain a lot of the variation that happens in sector and group ro- and stock rotation. So you, things can remain cheap for a long time. Things can remain uh, expensive for a long time. And that something, you know, there are extraneous factors that, that make things go up and down that have nothing to do with valuation. So I, I guess um, I, I have changed... Um, you mentioned fertilizer, chemicals, uh, uranium, a new short for me, okay, tentative. Um, uh, these stocks ran up huge. They were longs. You're talking to somebody who was long these things, as you were. And um, so what the model is good is, is, is it finding inflection points, spotting inflection points. And it's not perfect. It's not like you want to land you know, um, the spacecraft coming back from the moon or something uh, on a, it's not 99.99999999%, but it's pretty darn good and it, it it's pretty contrarian. So it sees a top in these things. So basically these things were bid up, fertilizer stocks were bid up, energy stocks were bid up, and it's just time for them to go down for a while. You know, simple as that. Um, Overowned, probably going into liquidation. Um, uh, you know, I'd like to mention two other little things real quickly that we didn't talk about yet. Um, one is the VIX, and the other is gold. Okay, the VIX, V-I-X, um, that is how somebody, don't ask me who it is, somebody, they in quotation marks, plays a huge game with the stock market and stock indexes with the VIX. It, it, I've watched this very closely. If you watch the way the VIX trades or the VXX, is a, it's a bad ETF, but um, people knock. There's just basically momentum ignition. It's a game, and he, some whoever does it, I don't know who it is, central banks, I have no direct knowledge, you know, probably hedge funds. It might not be one. It's probably a group. You know, they basically like to gang bang the market. And um, they have been successful in keeping the VIX down. Now, the VIX is around 30, you know, it's 29 something. Um, I have a long term forecast for the VIX up. So I think people who are they are playing with fire. So that that would be one thing to see a bottom in the market. I would like to see a major spike in the VIX, and it's been held, it's been suppressed. And suppressing the VIX, even though the stock market's down huge in this June and and in this quarter, um, it it would be down a lot more if it weren't for um, the games that whoever they are is playing with the VIX. And so... Just to put that in perspective, I think they're going to get taken out. So I think um, there's a huge short position in volatility, and I think sh- short sellers of volatility are going to get wiped out at some point. That might be a precondition for the market setting a low. We're not anywhere near yet that yet. The other thing is GDX. Okay, now I write, I have a um, retail gold stock newsletter. I cover every investable gold stock um, in the world, pretty much. You know, U.S., Canada, London, Johannesburg, Sydney. And China, um, and um, I, I am in the strange position of you know if you're gold, if you're run a gold, you're supposed to be a perma bull on gold, right? <clears throat> well, I covered every, I told everybody in the gold stock newsletter to cut, to be very cautious, not be long, you know, not you know this was like two months ago or something. So I've been saying, basically, do not be in gold stocks. So I'm. Um, kind of a strange situation for somebody that's supposed to be a permable on gold, but um, I have to go with the model. Anyways, gold has been a bad thing to be in, you know, GDX. However, I do see a potential turning point coming. It's not there yet. We're out like six weeks or something, but I just like to, to put that, I don't come on this um, on the Twitter spaces that often. 
Um, GDX could be setting up, not yet. Okay, I'm looking. I'm talking about things that haven't happened yet that are in the forecast. And it's like being on a boat that's approaching a dock. You don't want to jump uh, off the side of the boat when you're 100 yards from the dock because you'll fall in the water and drown. Um, but um, so there could be a potential turning point coming in um, in gold. In gold, gold itself is not down very much in June. It's flat on and it's down five percent in Q2. Gold stocks have been massacred. You know, GDX is down five percent in June, down twenty two percent in the second in Q2. But um, it's something to keep an eye on. That's the only metal play. All the other metal plays, forget about it. Aluminum, copper, tin, nickel. Um, they're all strong model shorts. You know, so G, um, the way to play that is DBB, the ETF dog boy boy DBB. Um, if you look at it, it's sold off, it's down 20 something percent. It's around the 200 day average. Um, I think it's going a lot lower. And then another short DBA, sorry, I hate to say it, agricultural, wheat, corn, soybeans, all these things that are supposed to be in shortages. They just, you know, to answer your question, these things, they had the run, you know, aluminum, um, uranium stocks, they had the run. They've over they've got they've overshot to the upside. They're overowned. They're probably going into liquidation. So at some point they might become a buy, but not now. For, to me, they're short. Thanks, Michael. Uh, one point I want to just try and if I may is this issue about fundamentals versus technicals. Um, horses for courses. Everyone has their own discipline and is successful in their own way. I try to use a multi pronged approach to investing. I look at charts. I look at macro. I look at individual stocks. Um, you know, in the long run, stocks follow earnings. You know, as my former boss, Peter Lynch, would say, you know, Coca-Cola went up 30x over 30 years. Well, the earnings went up 30x over 30 years. But that's not true every day, every week, every month. You can have divergences where something overachieves, goes up a lot more than it should, and then it gives it back or vice versa. And so, you know, Michael's call, just to, if, I, if I could be Switzerland in, in this debate, because I had someone on, on Twitter challenge I, I tweeted out something michael said about oil and this person didn't like it they're obviously long and so they said oh you know is this a sentiment call or is this a yeah i know what it was michael i tweeted out your 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 uh, a couple of sentences from the Belkin report this week and they're like oh is this just based on sentiment or on fundamentals and michael as is is, is i'm sure you'll get all the time when you go visit your fundamentally based clients they'll get hot because what you're saying is is maybe contrary to where they're book is positioned and so you can be totally right in the short run the next few months and the client can be totally right over the next few years but again it's a keynesian beauty contest and you're talking about it about what, what what duration you know is involved so it's never all one way or the other way and i think one of the problems i see with individual investors happen a lot in 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 social media is they get so caught up on the earnings and like Oh, because a company had good earnings, or become because a company's going to have good earnings, therefore the stock has to go up, no questions asked. Well, that's not the way it works. And you know, we try to teach people in these rooms, and you know, that's not the way it works. Maybe, maybe people can't under, don't get that concept so readily. But here's the concept they all will get readily, which is some bullshit stock, which you know has no earnings, has really crappy fundamentals, goes up hugely because it gets pumped in in FinTwit or Kathy Wood or whatever. People can readily see that there's a disconnect between the stock price and the fundamentals, you know, AMC to the moon or GameStop to the moon or whatever. They got no problem with that. But then when it's a stock you own, oh, Michael, oh, it's participant price. What do you mean it's going to go down? So I think that's where ego gets in the way. And it's good to try to step out of your position and stand back, avoiding participant bias. In other words, you never want to get to a place where the position owns you instead of you owning the position. So, Michael, could you shed a little light, because I'm sure you've had this type of problem a lot over the years, and could you just speak a little bit, because I, I see this, speak a little bit to what your experience is with this and maybe some of the more noteworthy uh, interactions. And also, I think you said it earlier, the bigger pushback you get to an idea, it's usually a pretty good contrary indicator. So, I don't know, just, just talk a little bit more about this disconnect, this between you know what people perceive to be the fundamentals and, and the price action and, 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 and how you... You, in the information content in the hostility, the severity of the hostility to your recommendations, what does that usually portend? Uh, good, good question. So one of the hardest things is to change your mind, okay? So 
I say that personally. So I have a system which which um, changes, right? It's not a broken clock. It doesn't say keep doing the same thing. I was long energy, now I'm short energy. But it, it's a it's a real mental battle to go from from having a position to having to uh, say just to go to eliminating that position much even more to say go to have the opposite position that is very very difficult mental exercise i have a problem with it i have to go with my i have a discipline that keeps me on the straight and narrow you know of, of doing it but i think i see that mental problem uh in people get married to their positions just like you said so whereas energy was um y- you know Nobody wanted to touch it 18, 12, 18 months ago. Now it's the most popular thing on Wall Street. And um, I get hostile pushback, definitely. Um, you know, so I have once or twice, I've actually been kind of physically <laughs> thrown out of people's offices. I won't even go into the details, but um, <laughs> it's kind of funny. And I know that I've hit a, hit a nerve when somebody like blows up, you know what I mean? <laughs> when I'm giving, I'm just giving, I'm being impartial. I'm saying, here's the, I show up with my laptop. I say, here's the long-term forecast. It was up, now it's down. And the people, their, t- their head explodes. And <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> um, I, I don't want to, I don't want to disparage anyone. I, 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 Michael, let me go in a slightly different direction. Um, of course, these clients will be in the federal wit- witness protection program. It's not for you to, <laughs> Say who they are. I'm never going to ask for anything. <laughs> but you must have your sort of, uh, how should we say, um, the clients you pay the most attention to, not necessarily because they're George Soros like people and they're always right, but how shall we say they have other abilities? They're almost perfect contrary indicators. So it's like, you know, they're kind of in, the, in your own hall of shame. And by the way, I don't know if any of you guys saw, but I pull up, put out this hall of shame, stupid. Chicago Bulls video, which I thought was pretty hysterical. But sort of the, the clients you can count on as being good contrary indicators. And so, again, without mentioning names, like, what are those people saying right now? Are they saying, you got to short bonds, you got to be long oil? Like, like wh- wh- what are those people saying? What, what are those most valuable clients saying right now? Yeah, um, so unfortunately, most of those kind of clients don't, they won't <laughs> subscribe to the Belkin report, but I do get that sentiment. Okay, you're absolutely right. So everybody, short bonds, long inflation, um, long energy stocks. Uh, so short, um, is anybody overly short? I don't get the sensation that there is like a massive short position in Apple stock, Tesla stock. Um, but if you just look at the numbers where Tesla stock used to have 20, 30% short interest when it was zooming up, um, it was everybody's favorite short. Now it's like two or 3% or something. The, uh, and of course, um, you know, I mean, Elon Musk, he wouldn't talk about mental, again, the mental idea. His stock is up so much. He, I don't think he ever would have made the Twitter deal. You know, if, if his stock wasn't up in the stratosphere, there's no way he would have felt wealthy like the world's wealthiest person so um yeah you know the a, a, a speculative bubble gives makes people feel like geniuses and they stick with their positions but you know the market the psychology of the market hasn't cracked yet so here again the s p is down nine percent in june down 17 percent in q2 and i see people still buying every dip and then i see these vix sellers sell 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 the vix sell volatility they want to sell volatility in the middle of a bear market and i see you know northman trader buying every dip buy 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 bitcoin interview michael saylor you know of of you know he, like so we're still like put, i still see people putting up um, bitcoin people on a pedestal you know, so the psychology, I, 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 the psychology is still really messed up in the market. Okay, it's still people are long something that's gone up a lot and just headed, started to head down. They don't want to hear about it. They're short bonds which have gone down enormously. They don't want to hear that they could bounce because the Fed's going to, you know, inflation's so bad. Fed's going to raise interest rates. Blah 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 blah. So, uh, I, I think we have dysfunctional psychology 
market is really messed up. People are messed up in the head. They don't see what's coming. They have the wrong positions on, and it's them getting flushed that's going to make things happen the way they're supposed to happen. And, Mike, I reflect that. I totally agree with you. I reflect that. I think part of the problem is, you know, we've had the most reckless financial monetary policy in history. And people in condition, Pebble, you know, in fact, Pebblevian style to buy the dip. So they just haven't gotten the memo. And this is one of the unintended consequences is having this long running bull market. I mean, there's just, it, they've been trained. And so I, I just think it, it's, to me, it's just remarkable. I know you look at flows. Michael, again, I only ask questions you know the answer to. What do you make of the fact we've had this, like, you know, total destruction? There's been plenty of, you know, blood and bodies strewn all over the highway. And retail's basically sold nothing. I mean, don't you find that extraordinary? <laughs> I do. I do. Like, where are these losses going? So, yeah. Okay. So, I follow um, uh, Refinitiv fund flows. And um, they're ETFs. Basically, we've had a disintermediation, which means funds are going out of mutual funds nonstop. So XETF fund flows are down like five, $10 billion every week. Um, equity fund flows. ETFs have been up um, until la uh, you know, there's a difference between refinitive and EPFR funds. There's sometimes they clash and say different things, but um, in general we've had like, so here previous week, 4.8, inflows into ETFs, e equity ETFs, 12 billion previous week, plus 14 billion previous week, plus 5 billion. So yeah, these guys, whoever they are, somebody is buying every dip in the bear market. I don't get it. Like, what? so hello? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. In other words, these, these are things you don't see at the bottom. I mean, this is just ridiculous. And, I and, mean, the fund so flows right george i mean mike are at all-time highs and consumer sentiments at all-time low and the market's down 20 percent. 100 percent aces 100 percent 100 percent all right let, let, let's keep moving here because we got a lot of questions i want to get through these let's move on quickly i want to go i think so we did din do we do do we do we did dorian i don't think lynn has spoken i think it's in lynn and then fly marbles and then Holden. newton sorry sorry aces what'd you say no 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 let's hold yeah Hold it, we'll get to you, buddy. All right, so wait, and so then wait. We got we got David down there too. Jerry. Yeah, I, I know. Aces, aces, aces. So let's just, just so not. You know. All right, so I want to yeah. I want to make the questions tight because I don't want this room to run on all day. So I think aces was Lynn next, I believe. I want to go in order. Is Lynn next? Yeah, Lynn's next. Fly Marble, uh, Holden, and then David. Okay. All right, Lynn. What's your question, please? Hi. Uh, thank you for taking my question, George. I appreciate it. Um, just a couple of quick ones. One. Uh, Michael, it sounded like you uh, you are kind of constructive on bonds. I was wondering if you have any concern about quantitative tightening and how that's going to do to the treasury market. That's one quick one. And the other one is, you know, I work in the institutional high yield market and my, you know, my thinking right now is really looking for places where uh, where market might be breaking down, uh, where you see blood on the street, which right now it just seems to me everything is pretty orderly. Uh, and you're not really seeing uh, a real markets and systemic breaking down of, of, of financial markets. And so from your perspective, what are your thoughts on where we might see uh, markets start to not function properly uh, uh, in, you know, globally, FX, credit, rates, uh, anywhere yes. that, uh, that that you're looking at. Uh, thank you. Okay, sure, yeah. Um, good question, QT. Um, so that seems to go uh, against, That's that would be an argument against this, uh, my uh, long treasury idea. Um, however, I, I'm looking at the Fed's balance sheet and it hasn't started shrinking yet. I mean, it's just kind of flat. Like, so they're talking the talk. Um, so what I think is, I think the Fed is out to lunch, okay? And um, I, I think at this point with the economy weakening, should be cutting interest rates. This is what they did in March, you know, February, March 2020 when COVID hit in 2007, 2008. Um, so they're just out of out of the cycle they're, they've been knocked out of the box so they're raising interest rates so and my saying is they're raising interest rates to cut them so i think um just whereas you know before 2020 the fed dot plot 
was up, 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 and then they cut rates by 100 basis, 100 something basis points right away. Um, when this economy goes down the tubes, they're going to be reversing course. I think all this credit QT and and interest rate hikes are going to go out the window um, just as quickly as they came in. So I think the Fed's just basically out to lunch. They're completely wrong. They they there's n they have never been this wrong. This is just ridiculous. So Powell has got to be the worst Fed chairman of all time. And he you know he's he's he comes up like he said he said um, in the last in the previous press conference he said I'm not going to hike rates by 75 basis points something to that extent right. Then he hiked rates by 75 basis points. Somebody you know, questioned him in the latest press conference about that. So they're just wrong. Now, on credit, um, uh, there's one thing you said that made me think. Uh, here's an anecdotal story. My nephew uh, runs an, a, a, a startup, which has been around for a long time. It, he was one of the original Y Combinator. You know, they're, they're, you know they... Um, uh, you know they fund new companies, um, and he was one of the original ones in that. And it's he's they've never gone public. They just you know they make money. It's called um, I forget what it's called. Uh, uh, Fabulous dot com, I believe it is. Anyways, um, it's something that he told me. I saw him in New York. He lives in New York now. He told me the credit market, the the IPO market of second round, third round, first rounds has completely frozen. This was uh, two weeks ago. I was having this conversation with him. So if you're like one of these IPOs that they started, he doesn't need, they don't need money anymore. His company makes money. But they're this whole food chain of these startup companies that were like, you know, they were given fish food to grow. They're not making money. They can't survive without constant in for second round, third round, fourth round, sixth round, you know, blah, blah, blah. That is over, okay? So the, the, the venture capital guys see what's coming and they have locked the doors, okay? So there's no more, uh, there's going to be no more fish food, you know, and the guppies are going to start floating up, upside down, you know, belly up in the fish tank. A lot of these startups are history. So um, there's just no more, they cannot survive without constant inflows. So that was great inf uh, insight I got from him. He's been involved in this IPO business for a long time. And he, you know, they're, they're like, you know, being conservative, uh, his company and just, you know, preser preserving cash, you know, looking to survive. So that's a kind of an insight into what's happening beneath the surface of the credit markets and the IPO markets. So Michael, hundred um, percent. I think I tweeted this out. If not, I'll, I will tweet it. Uh, there's a there's a website. It's one of these layoff tracker things. And this goes back to a comment um, I remember you made in the last room we were together a month or two ago, where you were talking about I think it was like in the Cal Berkeley newsletter, and you say, oh, I'm working for this startup and that startup. I mean, all these things are getting the lights turned out on them now. And this layoff tracker thing I'm talking about, it actually counts the number of people being laid off. And that thing has started to go up and to the right big time now. So. And, and, and this is not going to come back. This is not going to come back. And allied with that, you know, the, you were mentioning the private equity guys being toast. I mean, the Tiger Globals of the world and all those guys, D1 and Viking, all those things, anything that's levered to that stuff, over, finished, toast. So, and, and, and the thing is, this is, and what I really gets my blood boil, this isn't just the next quarter. This is like, this is an existential thing. For me, this is like, saying Japanese real estate's over, like it's over for decades, okay? This private equity nonsense and, and this, more importantly, this venture stuff, this is over for decades. We are never, ever going to see crap like this again. So, I don't know, Michael, could you put, I'm not asking you to agree with that, but could you just, you know, one of the things we go, you and I go back a long ways, could you just put in context sort of, I don't know, the zeitgeist, the sort of existential nature of the top we're seeing in this garbage compared to, prior tops whether you want to talk about japan in 89 or the nasdaq bust or whatever but to me some of the crap we've seen here in this cycle it's even worse than we saw in japan any thoughts on that yeah absolutely zytec you know that was what it was called remember the corporations were buying other corporations and there was all this incestuous cross holdings and crazy things that were uh, going on i kind of remember i flew <clears throat> solomon brothers when i was uh, you know i was a research analyst, write a research report. I was also in prop trading. They flew me to Japan a couple of times, you know, to talk to our clients in the late 90s, 1999. Um, I mean, 1989, I'm sorry, late 80s. Um, and 
I remember sitting down at the around the tea tables with Sumitomo Life, you know, and we're all got our squat legs, and I would, you know, we would ask them, you know, well, what do you think about the real estate? You know, don't don't you think real estate's, you know, it's kind of overpriced a little bit in Tokyo? And they're so, oh no, 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 this is Japan, Japan. We are different. Like I just remember that that they kept they all said we are different. This is different. This is not the same. And of course, that was right before the top. As as you said, it went into like a decade long. Bear market. Um, so a lot of that same kind of stuff in the IPO. Unfortunately, hey, I'm a big believer in capitalism and entrepreneurship. Nobody, you know, there's more, no more free market guy than me. You know, I love what what makes markets go up and down. That's what I'm all about. And entrepreneurship is great. You know, Von Mies, that's my background. You know, the conceptually, you know, entrepreneur goes out and makes a new product, finds a market for it. That's what, that's the wonderful part about capitalism. But that, you know, it's been tainted by this bubble stuff, right? So we've had this huge inflow of capital into all these IPO and private equity guys. They've, they've financed all these companies. Some of them, like my nephews, which have survived and will survive. But I think the vast vast majority of this round of things, they're just going to run out of oxygen, man, for like having COVID or something, you know, put them on a ventilator and the <laughs> ventilator doesn't save your life. <laughs> Michael, I love you, man. I know you write your own copy. It's just great to hear you. All right, so let, let's move on. I want to get through these questions. I want to keep you all day. You've been really generous with your time. And by the oh. way, um, you know, very few have been as right as Michael Belk, and I urge everyone to give a serious think about his research product. Um, again, I have no personal benefit from this. I'm just saying he's helped me immeasurably. And so um, anyway, so let's move on quickly. Keep the questions tight, please. I want to do uh, fly marbles and then hold in uh, Caulfield burger. Fly marbles. What's your question, please? Yeah. Thanks, George. Um, Michael, this question is for Michael. Um, what if it turns out that the economy is way weaker uh, than anybody uh, anticipated, and then in turn the Fed is forced to pivot and then uh, lower interest rates. Dollar crashes. <laughs> That's uh, I'm actually in. I'm in sympathy with that um, uh, scenario. So um, uh, right now, uh, okay, we didn't talk about that. We talked about the dollar a little bit, but. Um, Dollar, long dollar is a major consensus uh, position for people, right? And if you get the economy headed south and the whole uh, whole idea of Fed interest rate hikes goes out the window, um, then, you know, well, who's got the cleanest, dirtiest shirt, you know, in the in the group? Who knows? You know, um, it's not like there's a, other currencies are going to be a lot better than the dollar. But the dollar is over owned, just like you know, steel stocks and uranium stocks and fertilizer stocks and energy stocks. There's a lot of stale holders of the dollar. So um, that's a preview of coming attractions. I am not short the dollar yet. The model is not there yet. I do see it shaping up in the future, not clear when yet. So I think um, to answer your question very clearly, that would be um, uh, dollar down and that is what is going to make precious metals reverse, okay? So it's, we're not there yet. It's out in the distance. Um, it's approaching. And that could be the catalyst for reversal in the gold price, the silver price, platinum, palladium, and gold stocks, which are very depressed. So I'm not saying buy gold stocks now. I'm still negative on them. But I can, again, I'm looking, everything I do is in the forecast, 12 periods ahead, and it could be approaching Dollar peak, uh, bottom in gold. Not yet, but it's it's out there. Thanks, Michael. Uh, D D Dave Nikoski, if you had a quick following, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let you jump. The and and I agree a hundred percent with Michael on that. That's one thing that we've been, you know, uh, paying a very close attention to. And you are getting some RSI divergences on the U.S. dollar right now. Um, you know, if you look at foreign markets, you know, I don't see them in as much of a bubble as the U.S. in terms of equity prices. Um, certainly there's there's funding uh, requirements that foreign governments have. And you can see the emerging market bonds have been absolutely slaughtered relative to the even the U.S. bonds. Um, you know, one thing that stands out is even after the 2000 bubble, it was in early 2002 that you saw the U.S. dollar break down at that point. 
And you, what you did see is the emerging markets absolutely made their bottoms. And what you saw is foreign investors repatriated capital out of the U.S. So, you know, that that could be the, the start of the, the final swoon for us is if the dollar does decline, um, that's where you could see even further selling in the U.S. equities market. Uh, which which I think is highly probable, and right. you know d- it depends on the rate of change of the U.S. dollar decline. But if you look at a chart back into March of 2002, you know it, during the bubble you could have bought any old economy stock and made made money off of the March lows. But when the dollar gave up its gains uh, that it had been in, that's when you finally saw the you know massive sell off going into to end of 2002, early 2003. Thanks, David. Uh, yep. Gilberto, Gilberto, if you had a quick follow up, please, I'll let you in. Otherwise, you got a quick one, Gilberto? Gilberto, unmute, unmute yourself. I don't know if you're there. You no, no, no. So, sorry, I, I didn't know. I wasn't paying attention. I was requesting my, my, my opportunity to talk. Thank you. Yeah, but did, was, did you want to respond to something? If not, I'll put you back in the queue. Did you have... uh, put me back in the queue. Okay, I just I just, no, okay all right, just stay there for now. Okay, fine. All right, let's move on quickly. I want to go to. Uh, uh holden and then we're gonna do uh david holden you got a quick question holden yeah i do first off george three aces thank you i'm really really enjoying these spaces like immensely um so i really appreciate it uh michael awesome presentation um i really had two questions and one you just discussed it was really precious metals in the context of the dollar um the second is sort of an extrapolation of at least my fundamental view that um, what seems to be missing uh, at the moment, uh, it's very obvious to you know kick holes in the administration, they're doing a terrible job. Uh, but in the absence of uh, some industrial policy, uh, you would uh, expect to see the sort of price action that you're having because they're not addressing any of the supply issues. Um, how do you think about that in the context of the midterm cycle that's coming up uh, and uh, and then, of course, kicking off into the election year? Because in my mind, th- this is really what's going to uh, to drive things forward. Um, and then just one quick uh, anecdote comment. Um, the um, you know, you were talking about the, the fund the flows continually into um, mutual funds. Uh, we're all very familiar with the work that Mike Green has done uh, in terms of passive investing. Um, my sense there, uh, and this is really, you know, I don't want to misquote Mike, but I really respect his work here. Uh, it seems to me that as unemployment turns around and uh, and goes higher, uh, those 401ks uh, are going to see inflows shrink. Uh, and I think that bid will ultimately uh, shrink as well. Um, anyway, back to uh, the only question that I had left, which was the midterm cycle, the industrial policy mix and just how that works uh, in the context of, of your models and cycle work? Um, good question. Okay, um, I'm no big geopolitical expert, but um, uh, obviously <laughs> um, Biden's poll ratings are you know, extremely low and it bugs him and he's trying to do something about it. Um, uh, you know, I don't see any policies emerging that are going to solve any problems so in a way i kind of feel sorry for him you know like i he fell on his bike the other day i'm a mountain biker you know i live in this island outside outside of puget sound and i go down some insane cliffs and things and every once in a while you know i have a fall so i kind of felt sorry for him i didn't you know when when he fell you know he had these toe clip things that made him that stumbled him but anyways um he's the the point is he's kind of been left holding the bag so these things it's not like I'm a big fan of the Democrats or Biden or anything, but he's he's getting left holding the bag for a lot of these policies that have been gone on for years and years and administrations previously. And right now, basically, shit's hit the fan. So it's it's all it's kind of like the the solutions where they would just kind of keep, um, you know, layering more and more stimulus upon everything to try to get out of the last problem. That those days seem to be over for now. So um, it it looks. You know, the political situation is bad, and generally that's bad for the market. So I can't understand why it's not reflected more um, uh, in terms of, like you said, consumer sentiment is at a, it's at the lowest level recorded level. University of Michigan going back to the 40s, 
And meanwhile, they're still buying stocks. So there's a lot of way. This gets back to my idea of the, the psychology of the market is demented. Like something is just wrong. There's something is wrong with this picture. They, 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 people have been programmed like Pavlov's dog to keep buying the dip. Um, by the way, there's one little uh, uh, digression I'd like to make here. Um, we are approaching the end of the quarter, okay? So today's Thursday, next Thursday, five more days in this quarter. And um, investors play a lot of games in to, you know, the whole point, this ought to be illegal as far as I'm concerned, to ramp up your own stocks in, at the end of the quarter to just buy. I mean, people exist just to do this, right? But what, like I said, with the S&P down, in uh down nine percent in june before today down 17 percent in q2 the best these people who are who are long only who are like you know have the psychology of you only buy dips market only goes up they're going to do everything in their power over the next five days to ramp up the stocks that they already own that are down big so unfortunately that's the world that we live in where things like that which are unethical, basically, you know, I mean, it, it ought to be illegal as far as I'm concerned, but it's not. So anyways, I don't think it's going to work, though, because um, I would fade any kind of rally, anything that these guys push in terms of ramping things up, selling the VIX. That's part of the that's part of the program. Sell the VIX, try, try to create momentum ignition, ignition to make the market go up. Um, so, OK, so political, you mentioned money flow mutual funds are outflows they're non-stop mutual fund game is dead so the mutual funds are shifting from tax inefficient structures like mutual funds to into etfs so the etfs are gaining all the flows the 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 combination of the two um there's not ma massive inflows anymore like if you met, net out the mutual fund outflows and etf inflows it's slightly positive not very much See, so there's not a lot going on there there's one other last thing i'd like to mention D margin debt okay margin debt 752 billion it went from and it, starting in q when qe started march 2020 it was 479 billion peaked in last October, 935 billion. So basically doubled. People leveraged up, doubled margin debt. It's down so far, um, blah, blah, we're down 20%. Pretty similar to the market. But the 200 month average is like $400 billion. So we've got another three or $400 billion of margin debt liquidation, margin calls to go. And to me, that's the elephant in the room. Like the more the stock market goes down, the more these people that leveraged up get margin calls. They, you know, so you know how it works. They get a margin call. They have to sell, drives the price down in the stock. Somebody else gets a margin call, and this thing feeds on itself. That's called deleveraging. So we are in an environment. They leveraged up the bubble with Q, with fiscal stimulus, monetary stimulus. We are now in the deleveraging of the bubble, and this thing, you know. Again, I'm not a perma bear. I'd let, at the bottom of this thing, people won't want to touch pole stocks with a 10-foot pole, just like they didn't want to touch energy stocks. Um, so, but I think we're only like about halfway through this process. So, um, more deleveraging, more margin calls, more forced liquidation, which drives prices down, gives other people's margin calls, and that's not even to mention the who knows God knows how much um, OTC. That's just the listed leverage. You know, we have no idea how much brokers have extended to hedge funds and stuff. Um, and uh, so that, you know, that's the elephant in the room, margin debt liquidation. Thanks, Michael. All right. A few more questions. If you've got a question, raise your hand because we're not going to let this room all go all day. I want to get all the questions answered. Um, all right. Let's go to a smart guy. Let's go to Newman. And then we'll go to Newton. And then we'll go to Ors. Newman, what's up? Hey, how are you doing? So a couple things, things I wanted to hit on that Michael talked about. And then I will have a question for him in the end. So he talked about the VIX. I've been chatting with a lot of guys. There's a lot of degrossing going on in the sense that guys are selling stocks and selling puts. So they had the puts on, protect their, their positions. And then the reason why the VIX is a little stubborn, and you'll see skew is very flat, is because guys are selling their puts, they're selling their stock, and then the, 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 the long put, long stock is the same as a long call. So guys are like, why would I be long stocks and long puts? I'm going to dump that, and I'm just going to buy some calls to play the ride. That's why sort of the VIX is sort of stuck in the mud here to some degree. There's some degrossing. Now, someone else asked Michael about sort of what levels it could get nasty again. And I think that, again, after talking to some people, the 50% retrace on five years is about 3505 spoos. 
I think 3,500 is a big psych level. And I think that uh, maybe Michael can comment a little on it, but like 3,500 is probably a level where it could get messy again. Now to my question. Well, one more thing on the dollar. There are guys who postulated that the dollar 105 DXY was sort of reflecting max inflation expectations near term. And Michael had talked about this sort of deflation being the bigger issue going forward. I think it all juxtaposes kind of neatly with inflation, deflation, Michael's view on the dollar and gold. It's sort Newman, of setting, Newman, it's Newman, now, Newman, Newman, Newman. Is there a question, please? <laughs> yes, here it is. Here it is. So, Michael, you talked about EPS recession for a while and your numbers are considerably obviously lower than where the street is. I'd like to sort of get a, an update, and I, I'm sorry if I missed it early. I wasn't on the call at the outset. But, Michael, your thoughts on EPS, Can if you could get a little granular into Q2 uh, results, your thoughts on the model, I, I'd love to hear that. Okay, sure. Um, so, uh, so four times. Hey, Michael you're, Michael, you're in the Matrix. We can't hear you, Michael. Michael, you're in the Matrix. Hello. Can you hear me? Hear me? Hear me? Hear me? Hello? Hello? Yeah, now, Hello? Yeah, wait, wait. Yeah, Hello? Yeah, you're fine. Go ahead. Yeah, we hear you. Uh, okay, yeah. sorry. Uh, technology challenge here. Um, okay, 49 bucks. No, you're was in, the... no, you're in, Michael, you're in the matrix. Yeah, hello, 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 hello. How's that? Uh, yeah, hello? Michael, you, Michael, you moving around because you're good and then you're not good. Are you moving around? Uh, how's that? Is that better? I'm trying to get it close to my... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, just, yeah just, don't move, just don't move. Don't move. Okay, so 49 bucks is annualizing below 200. That was Q1. Um I think there's, I think, um, just look at Target and Walmart and, and all these, you know, there are going to be massive earnings misses in Q2. So I don't have a number for it, but my number for annualized S&P earnings at the bottom of this cycle is $110, which is half, which is less than half of any, even the most, probably the worst bearish out case out there. And, um, there's nothing ridiculous about that. That's just that's where the earnings go in a recession. So uh, I'm what I'm saying matches up with market history, matches up with trend analysis, 200 month average, match, matches up with the margin model forecast. Um, so yeah, earnings down. Um, and, and I found your comments about the VIX very interesting. Um, so, but what what it occurred to me is if they're degrossing, then they're covering their puts right. They're not even market hedged anymore, you know, and you're saying they're buying calls. So to, to, to participate side, I'm confident that if, if you're correct about this, um, that hedge fund, hedge fund world is not really hedging for the downside of a market crash from this level. And one, one, one last thing you said, so um, 3,500. That is where the 200-week average is for the S&P 500. 200-week. Um, so where, you know, 3,600-something, 3, 3,500 is the 200-week, which um, typically provides some support. But I'd like to point out that the Russell 2000 has already broken that level. It's way below it. And there's a lot of stocks, like all these um, software stocks. That level had a little bit of a bounce, Russell 2000, but didn't hold. And just like it didn't, by the way, it didn't hold in the bonds, TLT. I, I was um, back about three or four months ago, I was looking for a bounce around the 200 week average in the TLT, and it bounced for like a week or two, and then it went straight down afterwards. So th the 200 week average is not really holding. Um, it, it might be some temporary support, but when it breaks, it's already done. By the way, European indexes are already below that level. Um, they're starting to break, <clears throat> some of them. Um, so you say 3,500 as a support, as a make or break level for the S and P, I think you might be onto something there. We break the 200 week average, the 200 month average, just to refresh your memory, it's below 2,100, 2,068 currently down 44%. So I not, I mean, we're not going there in a straight line. You know, if we get there, it's going to be in a, you know, you know, bear market is a zigzag thing. It's like a lightning bolt pattern. Down, 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 up, down, 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 up, down, up, down, up. So you get these, you know, zigzag moves. And the whole point in a bear market is you don't buy them. <laughs> you don't buy the top. Right. You sell and short the rallies, three-day rallies, five-day rallies. Sh sell them, short them. Don't sell them in the hole. Selling in the hole can be hazardous to your wealth. So um, you got to get the psychology right for a bear market. Sell the bounces, 
just like you're supposed to buy the buy the dips in a bull market, you sell the valleys in a in a bear market. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Michael. All right, a few more questions. We're going to call it a day because we're we're, we're going two hours and ten minutes. Right, this is cruel and unusual punishment. Although I think we're all enjoying it. Newton, quick question. Newton, quick. Uh, Ur's quick question. Newton, keep it tight. What's up, George? Thank you for uh, your advice, or not your advice, for stating the case for keeping out of bonds this year. Uh, Michael, thank you for coming back. Um, you talked about TLT as being a uh, possible, probable long now. I was wondering if that extends further out in duration, either other ETF products like the EDV or zeros, or if you want to express yeah, that. No, yeah, no, no, let, me just, let me just cut short. I think the answer is yes. Michael likes victim generally, so... Um, the answer is yes. Uh, did I get that right, Michael? Yeah, treasuries. I see a, a top in yields, two-year yield, top, five-year yield, top, 10-year yield, yes. top, 30-year yield, top. Like, you know, they're, they're making a top, and it, it, that's in opposition to what the Fed is doing. So I think the weaker economy is going to create a – I think they overshot based on Fed open mouth operations – they they didn't raise interest rates that much yet, but they got the market to over adjust. So I like euro dollar futures as a long, which is super contrarian. You won't find anybody. hundred percent, hundred percent, Michael. Hundred percent. Thank you. Appreciate yeah, it, let, 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 Michael. Let's just move on because I don't want to keep you that much longer. So let's go to um, let's go to uh, to Jack Farley and then Vlad. Hey, Jack. Good to see you. What's up, Jack? Hey, George. Thanks for having me. I really like these spaces and. Uh, Michael, thanks so much for, for joining. I've, I've been listening a lot. Uh, so it sounds like you know, you're bearish energy. And I apologize if uh, you, you already answered this. I, I joined maybe 15, 20 minutes ago. But uh, so, you know, up until this year, the only safe haven has essentially been been energy, right? Like every other sector has just performed very, very badly. So if you don't think if you think energy is going to continue to go down, is there any sector that you think will be a safe haven? And I guess the, the like the formal way to ask the question would be, over the next six months, what do you think the best performing sector in the S&P 500 will be? And also, do you think that it will have a positive return or it will be the best performing thing, but still negative? Still negative. Consumer staples, utilities and healthcare. The relative up in, in the long term forecast, absolute down. So chicken law, that's the only thing that, for long only guys who can only be have to be long the market. It's overweight staples, utilities and healthcare, not energy anymore. Energy's out. So, um, and, but don't expect to make money. If you want to make money in, with alpha in defensive sectors, you got to be short. You got to be market neutral against it. By the way, I run, one of my clients is Alpha Capture Hedge Fund. Um, and uh, I implement things from the Belkin report. They have 50 stock positions in there and you can have longs or shorts. It's totally market neutral. And I put in that in there, I was, for, I was number one out of 170 something contributors in Q1. I was up 28%. I'm up 4% this quarter in Q2. I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not number one, but um, it's working. And I'm long. So the reason I'm not boasting, you know, I'm far from it. It's every day is a battle in the market. It's like World War I trench warfare. You stick your head up, somebody shoots at you. So I, it's, don't get me wrong, it's a battle. But I'm long things like Monster, Beverage, things that are working as shorts, Avis, in this pool that I run, which is totally market neutral. So to get back to your idea, you can be short, the uh, long Kellogg, you know, Kellogg splitting up. I'm long that in that portfolio. I've been long for months. Um, short things like semiconductors, Marvel Technology. So these are positions that I have on long Campbell Soup, Long Unilever, short Nucor, short um, NVIDIA, short um, Juniper, long Duke Energy, short Apple, long Clorox, short MicroStrategy, short Alphabet, short Tesla. You know, <laughs> so that's if you, if you want to be market neutral, um, unfortunately for long only guys, they can't do this, right? They're stuck. You got to mandate, you got to be long the market. So the best thing there, staples, utilities, healthcare. If you want to be, be able to sleep at night and just make pure alpha, not like not hundred percent, but you know, just gradually one step forward, two steps back. I mean, two steps forward, one step back. Sorry. Um, uh, be long defensive stuff, short tech and consumer discretionary and bubble stocks. Simple as that. 
Michael, thanks for that. And by the way, just so you know, the XOP, Mike, I don't know if you've been paying attention or not from your screen, but the XOP is down 7 bucks or 6% um, today since you came in this room and hasn't been able to uptick. So maybe maybe you're the culprit. All right, we got we got two more. We got three more, and then we're going to call it a day. Can I just so, say something to Michael? He's not alone on these long euro dollar features. I'm with you there, buddy. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff, okay. Emma. Good stuff. Okay. We're going to do three more, and that's going to be it. We're going to do Vlad, and then Urs, and then Cantro. Vlad, what's up? Uh, I'm fine. Thank you, George. Thank you, Michael. Well, basically, my question was about utilities, but uh, since it was, it has been answered, I was wondering, uh, is it uh, meaningful to start building position uh, to in uh, dividend stocks? Like... Um, What's what's your opinion of Michael of uh, this of driving this uh, dividend strategy during uh, the down cycle? Since uh, yeah, like buying utility stocks, maybe against uh, shorting uh, the yeah, of... yeah, Vlad, let, let me then Michael, let, let me take that question because I, I think I know the answer, and I, I you don't have to talk about this. Michael generally likes companies that are uh, defensive, and those tend to be more defensive. Also, as he's positive on fixed income. All things being equal, that'll tend to make uh, higher yielding stocks outperform. Michael, is that fairly represent your answer? If so, I'd like to move on to the next question. Yeah, absolutely. Up in relative terms, but not up in absolute terms. So it's a chi they're chicken longs designed to fall less than the market. If you're long only, it's the best thing you, you know, it's the best. It's the only thing in game in town. Right. But if you if you want to make an absolute gain positive alpha you got to be short something against it you know tech or consumer discretionary some kind of bubble stock yeah 100 percent. all right two more questions are going to be done we've been going to this for two hours and 18 minutes we got oars and then batting clean up we got cantro hey oars good to see you what's up oars thank you very much for taking my question so michael if i understand you correctly you're looking for a huge decline in the market and i'm going back since 1900 in the dow and there were eight declines in excess of about 45%, with the biggest one, of course, in 1929 to 32, which was 89%. If I understand you correctly, this bear market that we could be in would be the worst since 1929. Is this correct? Um, not entirely sure. So the 200-month average, we got there in, in after the TMT bubble top, 2000, Bottomed in October 2002 with the S&P down, you know, 50, 60 percent, um, right around the 200 month average. NASDAQ went down a lot more in 2007, 2008, 2009. We went down more than 50 percent in the S&P, got to the 200 month average. So at least something similar to that. You know, I, don't ask me exactly. But the 200 month average is, is at a similar downside level to as it was in 2002 at the bottom or 2009 at the bottom. Um, probably a lot more downside risk now than there was in at 2020 when the COVID thing hit because um, different point in the cycle, everything long-term is down now. So yeah, down, I don't know if it's going to be like the Great Depression. Um, I'm not going to stick my neck out that far. We'll have to wait and see. I just know down 50% from here and down 60% from here for the NASDAQ that's substantial, right? You know, I mean, nobody's really set up for that. And if that had happens, there's going to be a lot of unhappy hedge funds, hedge funds going out of business. And, um, uh, you know, I'm not rooting for that. I wish people, I'm trying to tell you the truth. I'm trying to get people on the right side of the primary trend of the market, which is down. So sell rallies, look for 40, 50% downside risk in the S&P, more than like 60% downside risk in the uh, NASDAQ and 70% downside risk in Bitcoin. Is there a period in, of time in the past, you know, looking at the Dow, that you think <laughs> assembles the current environment the most? Would it be like 1937 to 1942 or 73 to 82 or, or 1946 to 49? Is there a time that you look at and say, you can take this as a guideline? Yeah, we know they're all different. You know, I used to overlay charts with other charts. Um, I, you know, I, I was kind of famous for doing that when the Nikkei topped. And Nikkei followed the the 1929 pattern starting in 1990. Um, but you know, overlaying charts with other charts, it's kind of 
it's it's a little bit of a fool's game because it it works for a while and then it it changes because nothing is ever exactly like anything else. Of course, everything's some there can be similar patterns and this is similar. So all I can tell you is my long term model forecast is down just like it was in starting in two thousand and seven two thousand and eight when the S and P fell more than fifty percent or as it was in early two thousand where the S&P fell by 50%. And, um, you know, we're down 20% or something in the S&P. So there's a lot further downside risk. I think maybe if you made a combination of all the others, everything's different, right? And if anything, this cycle is more messed up because of what the Fed has done. So we we will probably end up with some new pattern out of this, you know, example. And, and then we can, you know, I think the world is going to turn on the Fed for getting inflation wrong and then get getting you know waiting way too long to raise interest rates then raising interest rates when the economy is weakening they're just completely off, off the wall so um i think this pattern will be different maybe similar to the other ones but all i can say is if you if i'm right on the direction and the intensity down 50% from here you know i mean that's significant thanks michael Thank all right, so we're going to come to Cantro be the last question. But before that, Aces, you got anything you want to say? And then we're going to go to Cantro. No, I just think it, it's fabulous. Uh, Michael did not say really, materially speaking, one word about um, liquidity, uh, you know, as we've been talking about it. Michael hasn't really touched much on the direction of rates. I think the entire focus is on intrinsic and earnings power. Uh, of the various group and sectors in the market. And I think it tops off beautifully what Jim Chanos was talking about and earnings and earnings estimates are way, way, right. way too high. And I think that's right up Cantro's alley. Uh, to so, 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 so you, Zang, I get to Cantro. I just got to say, I don't know what it is, Aces, but, you know, we were, we're talking about uh, the name Michael and how, I guess it means king in Hebrew. And all I got to say is we have, you know, we have a tremendous number of fantastic speakers in this room. But if you just go with any guy named Michael, whether it's Michael Belkin, Michael Howe, or Michael Kantrowitz, these have been three of, like, the biggest superstar for rent-a-car speakers we've had. And um, so anyone who's called Michael that comes in this room to talk, just listen to him. All right, so Cantro, no pressure. The floor is yours. What's up, my friend? Hey, George. And hey, Michael. Uh, I, had, I just had a quick question, uh, and I, I was listening to the first 20 minutes, and then I had to jump off, and I caught the last 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so. But um, totally agree with just about everything you said, uh, especially what you like on the long side. On the short side, though, you, you mentioned um, tech and discretionary, and, I, and I, I get where you're coming from, given everything you've said. But do you think that there's better alternatives, given that you know those two sectors are down the most – likely because you know they're they're most rate sensitive they're most covid pull forward sensitive and you know that's why i think a lot of the pain has shown up there first what, what why not financials industrials uh on the downside especially given your comments on interest rates and commodities you know on a relative basis i would think that tech and discretionary you know at least pieces of it would relatively do better than they've been doing if we start to see rates and commodities start going lower not higher thanks yeah, good point. Okay, so let me read you some names. Belkin Report this week. So I have a page, page six. Stronger U.S. groups, weaker U.S. groups. It's longs on the left, shorts on the right. This, everything, there are new positions. You know, things are removed. Things are added every week. Generally, they're pretty stable, and then everything changes, you know, substantially a couple times a year. So we added this week, oil and gas, energy service, forest products, containers, packaging, chemicals, auto finance. Let me just give you some names. Things that haven't fallen as much yet, to get to your question. Steel stocks, ramp to the sky, U.S. Steel, X, ATI, aluminum, AA, Nucorp, NUE, STLD, um, uh, uranium stocks, UUUU, New Short, URG, UEC, KALU. So steel stocks, New Short, they're up a lot. Oil and gas, MUR, MRO, DVN, CNQ, OXY. <laughs> uh, Buffett bought another $9 billion this week, supposedly. I, I, it was a long for me. Now it's a short. Energy service, HP, CLB, shorts. Um, uh, Forest products, LPX, WY, containers packaging, chemicals, HUN, DD, auto finance, 
A L L Y. You mentioned financials, um, uh, asset managers. Uh, so these are just um, these are stocks that I'm saying to short. The Belkin Report, uh, brokers, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, um, asset managers. Where are you, asset managers? Asset managers, credit cards, way up there. Ac um, that's some, something that's vulnerable to a uh, weaker economy. American Express, Visa. And some of these smaller ones, COF, um, that's not small, SYF, BFH, DFS, those are like uh, department store credit cards. Auto components, electric vehicles, well, they're already down a lot. Um, coal stocks, I mentioned, BTU. These are still stocks. So to answer your question, I just gave you about 20 names um, that are still way up. Agriculture, UAN, IPI, NTR, MOS. Um, stocks that are up a lot that are rolling over. So sell, you know, buy high, buy low, sell high. That's what the model likes to do. So those are sell high prospects. Um, good short ideas that are cyclical related as well as financial. So that's, there you go. Michael, I, I can't thank you enough. Cantra, do you have a follow-up? I didn't mean to cut you off, Cantra. No, 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 that's good. No, that's fine. I, I you know, I, I obviously knew there was more behind, uh, uh, and you were probably just mentioning those off the cuff. Um, so yeah, no, yeah, that's, yeah. That's I, I, think, I, I think the problem, if, go, if you listen to the replay, you'll get the whole thing, because Michael went over a lot of this stuff. I think it was when you were out of the room. So, uh, but I'll, I'll just say you and you, all the Michaels, Howell, Cantro, and Belk are on the same page. So I put my money on Michael. So there you go. Um, so Belkin, you just killed it again. And again, I repeat for everybody in this room, this has been an unbelievable room. We, we've had, we still have over a thousand people. I'm sure this will be listened to by 20 or 30,000 people before it's all over. I urge everyone to contact uh, Hyperpron at Hyperpron at H Y P E R P R O N uh, if they're interested in learning about Michael's service. Again, I have no commercial relationship with Michael. Uh, I bring Michael in here just because he helps me and he's helping you. And if you want to help him, that's great. But um, he gives it his time. And I know uh, he's really, it's, it's, he's enjoyed these rooms. That's why he comes back here. He's gotten for punishment. I think it's the third or fourth time, Michael, in, uh, in two or three months. And I know everyone really, really appreciates it. This is awesome. I, I want to thank you for myself, not just on behalf of others. At any rate, this has been great. Um, the, uh, we're having a room tomorrow, uh, Julian Brigden, uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern. Another really, really sharp guy. Must listen. Um, it's just the content in these rooms is mind boggling. The, the quality of these rooms, I just look at the audience and Cantro and Aces and Farley and KFAB and Nikoski and Urs and Anasa Haji didn't talk today, but always welcome. Porter, maybe you'll talk next time. Amy, maybe you'll talk next time. Emma, you were great. Awesome rooms. Javier, you got to come out of your hiding now that oil's going your way. I know you want to maintain a low profile. This has been awesome. And together, the community we've built really helping each other. That's what this is about. You're not. You're going to learn in here, not what you're getting from the street or CNBC or any of their wire houses. Uh, this is the real deal. This is truth. So anyway, Michael Belkin, I want to thank you so much. It's been awesome. I hope you'll come back again soon and uh, see everybody tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, George. Thank you. Bye. Bye.